Hello, everyone. Nice to see you on my channel, Touching Stories. Today you will hear an amazing story that is based on real events. It's a drama that will be a very important lesson for everyone. Sandra admired her reflection in the mirror, a tall, slender woman with luxurious hair. She hardly recognized herself. The black dress of classic style shone with a steely sheen, which only emphasized the dignity of her figure even more. Suddenly, a suspicious rustle was heard from behind, and then a whisper from Lily's eldest daughter. Mommy is so beautiful like a cartoon queen. Younger Lizzie said affirmatively, Wow. The girls thought their mother couldn't see them, but the mirror revealed their hidden agenda. And peeking is not good. Sandra turned around abruptly and the daughter squealed with delight. Mommy, we were trying to be quiet. We just really want to see it too. It's all Lizzie's fault. She's sniffing her nose so loud you can hear her three kilometers away. Sandra scooped up the girls and kissed each of them on the top of their sun-scented heads. Lizzie's sniffling has nothing to do with it, because the mirror gave you away. The older girl walked over to the dresser and immediately clapped her hands together. Oh, you can see everything, and we thought you wouldn't notice us. Suddenly, the little girl's voice faded. Daddy's coming. After the sisters secretly entered the parents' bedroom, the door remained ajar. Therefore, no one noticed the appearance of the head of the family. Cameron tried to give his voice a cheerful note, but his face expressed dissatisfaction. Who is distracting our mother? Go back to your room, you kittens. The girls looked at each other and ran out of the bedroom. Cameron didn't even throw them a funny joke, which sometimes happened when he was in a good mood. Hello. Today the man had been depressed since morning, so even his daughters were irritating him. Sandra, too, was all tense, waiting for the verdict. In addition, Cameron took a few steps away and looked at his wife for a minute. It was so unbearable that the woman asked in a half-whisper, Well, what do you say? Nothing good. Couldn't you have bought something more decent with the money I gave you? Cameron, the only thing I could have bought with that money was a warm robe. My parents gave it to me. I wonder why I'm finding out about this last one. I told you to keep me in the loop on everything including financial matters. But it was my parents who decided to help me out. It doesn't matter. You don't live on an island. There, you could do whatever you wanted. But you have a family, which means you have responsibilities and duties. The uplifted mood immediately evaporated. Sandra cast a fleeting glance in the mirror and saw there a droopy woman with dull eyes. Cameron noticed the movement. Look. Look at yourself. Don't look away. Now do you see why I'm always the only one attending important events? Even that shabby outfit you spent mad money on look all. I won't say the number out loud, years old. Tears of resentment appeared in the woman's eyes. Cameron, why are you making the spectacle here now? Go to your own corporate party if you're embarrassed of me. It's not like I asked to keep you company. The man jumped up to his wife, a changed look on his face. You're still raising your voice? You should be blowing dust off me. I provide for all of you, feed you. This apartment, by the way, I also bought it. I got into terrible debt. And all for what? To make my wife turn her nose up at me. Cameron grabbed Sandra's makeup bag and dumped its contents on the dressing table. This was all bought with my money too, so you better be quiet. He was about to head for the door, but then came back out again. I'll give you half an hour to pack. Andrea and his wife will pick us up. And as for your reproach, I'm really ashamed of your appearance. Can't you see you look like a tortured codfish? I'd love to go to the party alone, but the chief has ordered all the staff to come with their soulmates. So my situation is, by your grace, a hopeless one. Pouring out his frustration on the unfortunate woman, Cameron said more calmly, The dress you've chosen is really unfortunate, but it's too late to change anything. And I find your hair too inappropriate for your age. Why all the frivolous curls? I hope my shirt's not in this condition. Cameron, you'll see for yourself. I've prepared everything as usual. The husband went to tidy up the status quo. Sandra remained standing in front of the mirror. She wanted more than anything to tear off her dress and fall into the pillows, to let her tears flow, but there was some truth in Cameron's reproaches. She was indeed entirely dependent on him. After all, even for the necessary feminine trifles, her husband allocated her monthly funds. And after each trip to the store, she showed him the receipts. And this had been going on for almost 10 years. Line of checkers were heard from behind again. The daughters clung to their mother as if to comfort her. And the eldest, Lily, whispered, Mommy, 
Don't believe daddy. You are the most beautiful in the whole world. And he's scolding you on purpose because he's afraid. What is he afraid of? Don't you understand? What if while daddy's at work, that Sarevich comes and takes you away with him? That's what happened in the story you read to Lizzie and me the other day. Sandra laughed. But I'm not sleeping beauty. And there are no princes or princesses among my acquaintances. And anyway, go to your room now. Daddy will come and he'll swear at us again. This threat was followed by an instant reaction. The girls flew out of the room with cosmic speed. Left alone, Sandra adjusted her makeup. She took another critical look at herself in the mirror. Fuck that hairstyle. It's a mess on my head. In a minute, there was no trace of the curl design. The woman ran a comb through her long hair and then braided the strands into a beautiful herringbone and laid the braid on the side. That really is better. The woman, for the first time in just one day, caught herself thinking that agreeing with her husband in everything had become a tradition for her. She was used to obediently following his orders, used to his perpetual displeasure. It had gotten to the point where she was afraid to move at night to avoid waking Cameron. But the worst was that her husband takes such servile behavior as a norm, and not so long ago, things had been different. How could she not have noticed her transformation into a slave? This was not the first time this question had arisen for Sandra. After all, ten years in the scale of one human life is a long time. But it so happened that Cameron has imperceptibly become for her not only the main person, but also the ruler of her fate. Unfortunately, she realized it too late. And now she has to bear all the insults and humiliations without complaint. But all this she is willing to endure only because there is hope that one day she will again see that kind Cameron, who for her was from childhood the standard of a real man. Sandra was too young to remember the details of their first meeting, but Millie Rose loved to tell how her three-year-old daughter had declared in a loud voice when you group brought in the new boy. This is my friend. To assert this right, the little girl squeezed the baby's palm tightly and led him to the part of the room where there was a play corner. The pupils of the younger group fell silent, and the adult witnesses of this touching scene smiled. But no one objected to this division of roles. Then Sandra was not characterized by a soft character and any aggression on the part of her peers responded sharply. And her methods of fighting with opponents allowed the use of brute physical force. Therefore, Millie Rose often had to blush because of the unworthy behavior of a small bandit. Charles Rose about the pranks of this Harris proudly stated, We've got a streak. We have such a family name. So in the family, we have no Slovakov. Millie Rose always said to such praise. Next time you'll go after your daughter. I'm not the only one who has to take the blame for her bad upbringing. The man was genuinely indignant. Who dares to say such a thing is a fool? That's what you'll tell the teacher personally. Because she thinks that you and I are failing in our parenting duties. Charles Rose rushed to stand up for justice but his optimism didn't last long. Literally a week later, righteous fervor faded and loving father found any excuse not to cross the threshold of the kindergarten. However, since the advent of under the chief in the face of fatty Cameron Sandra a little changed for the better. The same teacher, who not so long ago criticized the girl's behavior, now at every turn praised her. Sandra is an angel. Cameron is clumsy and not everything the kid does well and she tries to help him in everything, and such tutelage, you know, gives its fruits. The boy tries to imitate his girlfriend. Sandra and in his school years was for Cameron either a beacon or a guiding star. If he did something on his own, he always looked back at Sandra. The boy needed her support like air. But Cameron himself also tried to respond in the same coin. Back in the third grade, the guy showed his wrestling character when he was not afraid of the guys who were two years older fifth graders decided to shake their fellow younger age, and as a victim they chose girls. Cameron stumbled upon the humiliating scene by accident. Three girls from the class surrounded by immature racketeers were desperately crying. Boys, we really don't have any money, we spent it all in the cafeteria. One bigger boy spat through his teeth. What if we shook it like a branch? The girls cried even louder, but those tears made the extortionists even more angry. One of them grabbed the smallest girl by the hood of her jacket. Cameron, without thinking of the consequences, grabbed some stick and together with it went to ram the enemy with a shout. You assholes, let the girls go. 
The hooligans obviously did not expect such a turn of events and rushed away. The rescued classmates later told everyone about Cameron's courage, and the young hero was embarrassed by the unexpectedly fell on him popularity. But his moment of fame was short-lived. When the novice bandits realized that screwed up in front of the third grader, they decided to that cruel revenge. And the next day, after the landmark rescue of girls under the eye of yesterday's hero was a huge black eye. The rescued girls sighed and rolled their eyes prettily. Cameron, we got you in trouble. Now you can cheat off my math homework for the whole quarter. A second classmate wanted to get him into a ballroom dance class, but Cameron delicately declined all help and proudly said, Bruises are nothing. Scars adorn the face of a real man. But the popularity of Cameron did not like Sandra. When his classmates started circling him like flies, she seriously warned them. Stone is my friend. We've been friends since kindergarten. And just because Cameron protected you doesn't mean he's going to hang out with you. The classmates didn't need to be told twice and quickly refocused their attention on another object. But Cameron had already gotten a taste of popularity and was angered by Sandra's interference. Rose, why are you meddling where you're not asked? Maybe I don't want to be friends with you anymore. This statement annoyed, but did not scare Sandra. The girl stopped paying attention to Cameron and he had no access to her notebooks. Of course, he could move to another desk and many girls would be happy to have such a neighborhood, but something told him that he should not make public the spoiled relationship with Sandra. The tense situation resolved itself. All the holidays at school were celebrated brightly, but with the involvement of their own talents. When the program of the event for Defender of the Fatherland Day was drawn up, all that was left was to find worthy presenters. At the Pedagogical Council discussed different candidates, but the principal herself unexpectedly suggested, What are we puzzling over here? In the third A, there is a beautiful couple, Sandra and Cameron. One of the teachers objected. They're very young. And that's great. Kids are always viewed positively, even if they make mistakes. This common cause brought the friends together again. They did an excellent job. And many said that it was the presenters who were the highlight of the concert program. Sandra was in the crossfire of glances for the first time, and Cameron already knew the taste of fame. Then after the concert, he suddenly realized that Sandra could be the bridge from which he could jump more than once. This discovery both shocked and pleased the ambitious boy. He held out his hand to his girlfriend, Sandra. I'm sorry I was wrong. I said some nonsense to you. The girl was embarrassed. She did not expect such words. It was out of his character. Oh, come on now, Cameron. I'm not mad. She smiled openly and immediately realized how much she missed their interactions. Friendship forever then? Sandra laughed with joy overflowing her soul and Cameron chimed in. Friendship is strong. It won't break. Her friend picked up on it in a thin voice. It won't break through the rains and blizzards. They selflessly sang the popular children's song, holding hands and looking into each other's eyes. And at that moment, they sincerely believed that no one and nothing could break their friendship. About how the world seems very different when you're young. This is a well-known fact Sandra and Cameron were convinced that they should only step on the broad road to adulthood, and they will walk on it easily and confidently. Although both on the excellent certificate did not pull, but the chances of entering a good university were high. At that time in the country, there was a demand for lawyers, economists, and a couple decided to apply directly to the Capital University. Sandra had some last-minute doubts. Cameron, aren't you and I a little overconfident? After all, this is not something, but a very serious educational institution. Courage conquers cities. Remember that proverb? The girl realized that Cameron was encouraging them. Somewhere in the back of her mind, she agreed with him, but the doubts were growing. I remember but something doesn't make me feel at ease. What's with the sluggish mood? Sandra, I don't recognize you. You were always brave, weren't you? That was before, at my home school. It's all the same. This is Chicago. Why don't you and I find something a little more modest? There are plenty of good schools all over the country. Cameron got serious. I'll try to prove to you the evil truth of life on my fingers. Indeed, there are many institutes in our beautiful country but only the capital's universities have an impeccable reputation. Even if your diploma is full of C's with a rare speck of Thursday, the mere fact of graduating from an institute in Chicago will be a huge advantage when applying for your first job. 
I probably don't need to tell you that career advancement is directly related to where you start. Sandra looked at the guy as if she was seeing him for the first time. They had interacted so much, knew so much about each other. Sandra understood that Cameron wanted to accomplish something, but for him to have such emphatic, pragmatic thoughts, she hadn't realized. He even seemed distant, unfamiliar to her now. Cameron, you have such a strange way of thinking. I even get the impression you're repeating someone else's words. I don't deny it. There's a point, but I don't see anything wrong with it. Look, you and I, I mean, we both come from average families. Our parents are positive people, real hard workers. What's wrong with that? My father has a wall full of certificates of honor. What do we do with these props? What do we do with them? What use is it? Cameron, you're not making any sense right now. You think that because you've been raised with outdated stereotypes, but life changes and today we have different priorities because enthusiasm alone will not get us far. My father realized this a long time ago, but he didn't have time to readjust. It was him who laid out the rules of life for me. From the beginning, as the great poet said, one should aim oneself at achieving the main goal from a young age. Of course, at first it may seem unattainable, but if you set the right accents, everything will work out. You surprise me, and I've never looked that far. It always seemed to me that it is necessary, as in a computer game, to pass from one level to another. In principle, you are correct in your reasoning, but the main goal should be set right away, using your comparison as a target. Cameron looked at her with eyes that Sandra realized her arguments will not be heard, but still tried. Wait, Cameron, what if we don't get in? I'll definitely get in. I'm sure of it. If I can't get in on a budget, I'll go to a tuition-free program. That's a lot of money. My parents don't have that kind of money. She didn't understand how Cameron could say that. It was like she was a stranger and an outsider to him. No way. She must have imagined it or misunderstood. Turns out she got it right. I can't help you there. As they say, to each his own. By the time he left school, Cameron's selfishness was evident in the smallest things. One day, Rose was careful to point this out to her daughter. Sandra, I don't like to meddle in other people's affairs, but I don't like the fact that Cameron is taking advantage of you. Don't you see that? Mom, you're imagining it. We're on good terms. He helps me with a lot of things too. I don't see it. I don't see it. God be with you. They left town together. As is customary in such cases, parents gave a farewell. And the fledglings believed that at the first time they would conquer not only the capital, but the whole world. But Sandra immediately flew. She did not have enough points to get on the budget. And Cameron was jubilant because he passed the competition. Sandra cried all day from resentment, but she didn't want to go back to her town. One girl with whom they lived together in the dormitory advised, Many people after the first run find themselves in the gap. It's normal. Now the main thing is not to miss a year. You can find out where you did not get enough to learn some other useful profession. This option interested Sandra and she went together with her neighbor to look for an educational institution. For a whole day, they passed more than a dozen colleges and colleges, but everything was already packed to the brim and only one college of food industry had a few free places. But the girls, tired from their search, were satisfied with the result. Sandra thought that Cameron would be happy when he found out that she would be studying in the capital after all. The girl decided to tell him this happy news over the phone, but her friend's answer knocked her down. You realize that college is a judgment. Now everyone will look at you as inferior. It would be better if you went home, and next year you could try again. Sandra tried to change her friend's mind, but he firmly believed in his rightness. The girl called him several times, hoping to meet him but Cameron each time found a hundred excuses so that the date did not take place. May, the girl they went to college with, remarked, looks like your date is embarrassed of you. He's my friend. We didn't do anything like that. And too bad. Whatever they say, guys like consistency. Yeah, they can have an affair with your girlfriend on the side, but God forbid they get what they used to think was their stolen from under their noses. Are you implying something? I'm not implying anything. I'm telling you straight up. Make your Cameron worry. You're an attractive girl. You can have a boyfriend. May, do you think that's going to work? May, I'm sure your friend will come running. How do I put this plan into action? It's very simple. 
May's method was simple, but most importantly, it didn't require anything. The executor was quickly found too. Sandra was being courted by a guy who was nearing the end of his studies. Scott was a fan of cooking and dreamed of having his own restaurant. He was jokingly called the cook's book in college because he knew thousands of recipes and fascinatingly told about the national features of cuisines of different countries of the world. Scott invited Sandra to a cafe a couple of times, and she from boredom agreed to keep him company on the advice of her neighbor. The girl began to give the guy signs of attention and soon he already followed her like a needle. On the first holiday of spring, Sandra came to visit her parents with Scott. The young man immediately took a liking to his parents. Rose was impressed by his knowledge of cooking. The mother enthusiastically whispered to her daughter so as not to hear the guest. Sandra, this guy is a real treasure. He's a treasure. Don't let him get away so you don't have to bite your elbows later. Mom, Scott's just a good friend of mine. What is it with you people and making plans for the future? It's okay because all parents worry about their kids and wish them well. You already had a best friend, but he hasn't been around lately. He's probably embarrassed to be friends with a girl who's studying to be a chef, because today bankers rule the roost. Rose talked about Cameronin, mentioning his name, which showed her strong resentment towards her daughter's former classmate. Sandra was amazed at how good a judge of character her mother was, but in remembrance of an old friendship, she still stood up for the one she was always thinking about. Mom, you say yourself that you can't just judge a person. Cameron has a goal and he's on his way to it. Freshman year at any school is the most difficult period. I'll admit that even I have problems, even though I'm in college. But in the summer, if everything works out well, I'll go back to university. And this is the right decision. Here I support you in everything. The holidays flew by like one minute and the guests had to return to the capital. But May's plan worked 100%. Literally the next evening after returning to the capital, there was a knock at the room where Sandra and her friend lived. When the girl opened the door, she was stunned by surprise. In front of her with a confused smile stood Cameron. Hello. The guy pulled out a huge bouquet of flowers from some unknown secret place. I'm sorry I'm late, but I want to wish you a happy spring festival. I couldn't get here sooner. You probably weren't expecting me. You were right. I haven't been expecting you for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, what's an old friend for when there's so many suitors around? Yeah, I heard you got a boyfriend. Is it serious? Sandra's soul was ringing with joy. She had no idea that May's plans would bear fruit so quickly. Since when did you become interested in my life? Sandra, can I come in? It's a bit awkward talking in the doorway. Sandra. Yes, of course, I'm sorry, but your visit is so unexpected that I was confused and about the old friendship. It was you who stopped answering my calls, and since I don't have a monastic vow, I have every right to go on a date. Cameron, but you're the one who told me to go for it. That's right, but I think your only goal right now is our family. I want my house to be warm and cozy, to have children's laughter in it. And what will we live on? Let now our parents help us a lot, but they will not be forever pulling from the last strength. I'm not going to put such a burden on their shoulders, I only have two years of schooling left, and then I promise that I will do everything I can to provide for my family. Sandra listened to her husband's optimistic plans and suddenly asked, Cameron, tell me honestly, why did you marry me? This conversation took place during breakfast and the man almost choked on a sandwich with sausage and cheese. Sandra, you can't ask stupid questions while you're eating. Sandra, it's a bad habit most women have, but I'll tell you this. I didn't even consider another candidate for a wife. You and I know each other well, which is good for our marriage. Besides, you're a great hostess and a great cook. In a word, I have complete confidence in you. Cameron, what about love? Did you marry me for pragmatic reasons? Sandra was stunned by her husband's revelation. She had expected to hear from him completely different words, but he did not see fit to say them, even for the sake of propriety. The young woman felt humiliated. She wanted to say something to her husband, but Cameron caught her mood and beat her to it. Love is a beautiful word, of course, and I understand what a storm is raging in your sensitive heart, but life is a harsh thing. You can't go far on love alone. For me, it's more important the material side in everyday life. And lyrics, that's a secondary matter. So you didn't marry me for love, but out of convenience? 
Cameron looked at his wife the way one looks at a hopelessly ill person. Yes, what's wrong with that? I'm comfortable with you, and I plan to live my life that way. And thanks for the delicious breakfast. Her husband never answered the main question, but Sandra didn't dare to ask it anymore, because she knew the answer. That day she realized how right her mother had been. Everything inside her protested and the voice of reason shouted, Leave him now, or it will be too late. Where is your prize, Sandra? The young woman did not heed this call and stayed. It was her first sacrifice, made on the altar of, as she thought, marital happiness. Cameron was a subtle psychologist and immediately realized that he had won the first victory. Every day thereafter, he methodically suppressed his wife's own self. His dictate was well thought out and from the outside resembled the care of a beloved woman. Another advantageous quality possessed Cameron. He always acted proactively, not giving his wife a chance to recollect. Just a year of living together, Sandra turned into an obedient servant of her husband. She fulfilled his every whim at the first request. When Cameron learned that they would have a child, he began to control her every move. Therefore, Sandra had to leave the university after two years of study. Subsequently, she left in work, which gave her at least a small opportunity to realize herself. The only consolation for the young woman became children. A year and a half after the birth of Lily, Sandra became pregnant again. This period was the happiest in her life because Cameron weakened control and she could afford small weaknesses. Her husband simply adored his daughters and made plans for the future. We're not gonna stop there. You still have to give me a son. Sandra tried to joke, Cameron, come down to earth. We are already cramped in this rented apartment and you are already planning a third child. Don't worry, wife. Very soon our living conditions will improve. Sandra knew that her husband was not used to throwing words into the wind and waited patiently. She did not pester him with questions because for several years of life together learned that unnecessary curiosity only makes her husband angry and she did not want to burst into scandal. One day, husband came from work in an elevated mood. He picked up his eldest daughter who ran up to him. Yes, of course, it's my own fault, but you realize that the life of a student. The girl interrupted the guest. Cameron, I understand everything. It's hard for you. You sleep three to four hours, you have a goal, but you forgot one little thing. I'm a student too. Yes, the profession I'm learning is not so prestigious, but if there are no cooks, bankers and other professions will have a hard time. The young man looked at Sandra as if he was seeing her for the first time. The girl noticed how he blushed to the roots of his hair, so she realized that her suspicion was not groundless and Cameron was really shy of her society. But the fear of losing such a convenient and fail-safe defense still overpowered ambition. But soon there was another reason that forced Cameron to protect his friend from outside influence. The guy was pleasantly surprised to learn that in a few months Sandra learned to cook. One day the girl, along with her friend, asked to visit Cameron. He agreed, but warned. You just do not fall, but we have everything Spartan. May couldn't help herself as she stepped into the room. This isn't a room to live in, it's a den. So outsiders are asked to leave, and Sandra and I will try to make everything look more or less decent. Not even two hours later, the tennis looked around apprehensively, not believing that they were in their room but even more surprised when the temporary hostesses invited them to the table, in the center of which a large pot shone with pristine brilliance. The reaction of the ravenous students pleased Maya immensely. It seemed to her that another minute of delay and the guys would go into shock from the increased saliva. From what was in your refrigerator, we could only boil borscht. So, dear hosts, don't apologize for the modest table. But four sturdy guys were not up to etiquette, and they greedily pounced on the food. But their appetite didn't stop them from praising the girls from time to time. Tasty, yummy, it's like home. It's been a long time since I've had such a hearty lunch. Today, we have a real belly feast. The girls were happy with the result of the action, and the guys invited them to visit. Girls, your borscht is like the elixir of life. Come again, next time we will buy more food. Maybe you can make us some cutlets. May winked at her friend. It's true what they say that the shortest way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Today, I was convinced of that. Sandra was absorbed in her own thoughts and didn't answer. May tugged her friend's arm. Sandra, wake up. Listen, what do you think of Fred? 
Fred who? The skinny, tall one. And the one with the glasses? He's okay, he's cute. I thought he was nice too. Him. Her friend's romance with the future banker spun so fast that in the summer the couple got married. The newlyweds rented an apartment and Sandra was left alone in the dormitory. But this loneliness was not long. In the fall, she entered the university on a correspondence course. Cameron also agreed that to combine study and work is the best option for a couple who are going to become a family in the near future. Only in this happy picture, there was no place for Scott. The guy from afar saw a shining Sandra in the company of a childhood friend and understood everything without words. No, he didn't hold a grudge against the girl he really liked very much. But realizing that his chances were practically zero to zero, he silently retreated. Then he could not suspect that many years would pass and he would play a major role in Sandra's fate. Rose was unpleasantly surprised by her daughter's decision to marry her childhood friend. But most of all the woman was worried about Scott, who liked him very much. Sandra, have you thought this through? Cameron is a selfish, a selfish man. You're gonna have a lot of grief with him. Mom, you're acting weird. Instead of wishing us happiness, you're making terrible predictions. Henry didn't interfere, but it wasn't hard to tell from his look that he wasn't thrilled about the wedding either. He decided to talk to Sandra just before the ceremony. Daughter, I just want to say one thing. Do not confuse childhood friendship with love. Are you sure Cameron feels that way about you? Of course, Dad, or he wouldn't have proposed to me. But as the emotions subsided after the wedding, Sandra began to ask herself that question more and more often. All the burdens of family life she had to pull on herself. Even more complicated life was the study. Cameron advised his young wife to drop out of university. Sandra, why bother with your brain? Sandra, why bother with your brain? You have a good profession, by the way, very useful for the family. I love your borscht and everything you make. When they arrived at the restaurant, where the event was held on the occasion of the bank's anniversary, the party was already in full swing. After a brief introduction of the guests, the chief took Cameron aside. Your wife is a real beauty. Women are the jewelry of our lives, so they need to be treated with care. Sandra felt awkward around strangers, but she was not alone for long. Suddenly, a familiar voice sounded nearby. What a surprise. How nice to see you here, Sandra. The woman hardly recognized Freddy, the lanky young man who had won the heart of her doormate. I didn't expect to see you here either. Cameron didn't tell me you two were working together. You're not gonna believe this, but I'm just a guest at this party. I work for a company that works closely with the bank. You don't even know, Sandra, that your husband was the lucky ticket. Everyone else in our company is more modest, although none of us have any reason to complain about life. Wait, Valerie, why are you alone? Why are you alone? Where's May? My wife is like the Flying Dutchman. You may have heard of it. May appears like a mirage and then disappears. She's currently in Italy. You may not know that my wife has her own restaurant, but that's not enough. She's got a whole chain. Something under Sandra's heart stabbed painfully. She wanted to ask Freddy something else, but Cameron returned. He nodded nonchalantly to his former classmate. Hi, we'll talk later. Three. Her husband didn't let go of Sandra's hand. Cameron, where are you dragging me? By the way it hurts. It's okay, you'll get over it. I told you to keep a low profile. I'll find our seats and you'll wait patiently for me. The organizers refused from the traditional long table, and all the guests of the feast were seated at separate tables, in groups of six people, so that the participants of the feast did not get lost. Each seat was marked with a flirty nameplate. Cameron quickly found his last name. You see, it says, that's you and me. Sit down and wait. I hope I can go to the bathroom. You were being ironic. You were being ironic. Sit down. I have to talk to someone else. Her husband's behavior made the woman angry, and she could barely contain her emotions. Cameron, why all the trouble? Why did you bring me here? To make fun of me. So I could be alone. Like a garden scarecrow. I'm sick of it. The man squeezed his wife's hand and hissed in her face. Imogene, me too. You better be quiet, or I won't be able to take care of myself, and I'll deal with you at home. Sandra had never seen her husband in such a state before, and his last words truly frightened her. 
All around her the cheer was buzzing, toasts and congratulations were being made, but Sandra felt like a vacuum-packed walled-in person. She raised her glass together with everyone else, but barely tasted it and put it back. The woman didn't touch the food at all, but Cameron behaved very actively and almost did not sit still. He was having a blast on the stage. Sandra immediately noticed that a gorgeous blonde in a gorgeous dress of sky blue color did not leave his side. She did not pay attention to it at first, but during another dance she noticed how the strange woman pressed against her husband and Cameron's hand at that moment was below the waist of her part. Well, my princesses, we'll be moving soon. We will have a large apartment in the new neighborhood. Sandra was wary. Cameron, but where did we get that kind of money? Have you forgotten where your husband works? That's right, at the bank. I already took out a soft loan, then we have not used the maternity capital, and I even forgot about it. We could use the extra money now. By the way, I've already paid the installment and all the necessary documents. I think you don't mind that I took care of this issue. Sure, Cameron, I don't know anything about the law, and you're doing this for our family. Exactly, and I'm glad you realize that. I hope you'll feed me tonight for the good news. I'm all set. I've got the first course and the second course. If you knew how much I appreciate moments like this. I'm a Cameron too, and I wish there were more of them, but her husband didn't hear her. He went to the bathroom to wash his hands, where his joyful voice came from. Well, I've got more good news. I've been offered the position of head of security. Of course, I will have to go through some procedures, because it is a very responsible position. Sandra handed her husband a clean towel. You'll do great. It's a really unusual day today. I even feel like the sun is shining brighter. All happy people feel that way. All happy people feel that way. And I'm very happy to see you happy. Cameron pulled his wife to him and kissed her hard. It was a very different kiss. It wasn't the kind of kiss he bestow on a woman on the run to work. It was a special time for the couple. Moving into a new apartment had brought them together. Everyone in the family was fully engaged in getting their lives together. While Cameron disappeared at work, Sandra was engaged in minor repairs. Help the young family decided to help in parents. Even Lily and Lizzie tried to contribute to the common cause, but it was not always successful with the little girls. When the repair was finished, Rose wanted to talk to her daughter in the field. Are you happy or are you trying to be? Mommy, have I ever lied to you? Why are you asking me? You look tired. It's been a long time since we've seen each other and the change is very noticeable. Have I aged so much? You've gotten a little dull over something and your eyes are confused. You look confused and you keep averting your eyes as if you're afraid I'll read something in them. Sandra sat down on the table opposite her mother and her condition was not hard to guess because she nervously rubbed the fringe of the tablecloth on the table. Mom, even if I'm not completely happy, but only trying to portray it, still nothing can change. Yes, I often catch myself thinking that I dreamed of a different life. Yes, I constantly feel like a bird in a cage and I'm aching to break free. But you realize I can't afford it. I have kids and they need a father. Cameron loves the girls, they love him. Rose cried softly. Daughter, daughter, what a life you've condemned yourself to. And it could have been different. I can't understand where your character has gone. You were so stubborn as a child and as a teenager. Sandra grinned bitterly. Mom, you know the answers to these questions. It's my own fault for letting myself dissolve into my husband. All that's left of me is a shadow. Everything else I put on the altar of marital happiness. Perhaps I've made a strong comparison, but it's the one that best fits the situation. I don't know what to tell you, but remember, you have family to help you. Thank you, Mom but I still have faith that things will work out with Cameron and me. Rose said nothing. She felt in her heart that this way her daughter is trying to hold on to the last hope, which is about to disappear forever, like a star in the morning sky. If the first years of married life Cameron still sometimes heard the voice of conscience after moving into a new apartment, he stopped listening to it. He felt himself the master of life, and on anyone who disagreed with this distribution of roles. There was a lot of pressure on his part. Of course, it was Sandra who was getting the brunt of it, although the woman had recently completely lost the ability to resist. But strangely enough, 
it was this blind obedience that threw the man off balance and he had to make a great effort not to spill his irritation on his wife in public during the corporate party. I'm sorry, but I have to go. Sandra went to the ladies' room to wash her hands, but noticed in a dark corner near the closet a couple hidden from prying eyes. The men and women were seated comfortably in chairs, but she recognized Cameron immediately from his voice. But bear with me a little longer, now is not the time to change things. In response, a woman whispered hotly, Cameron, I've been patient for three years. Believe me, I can't have that old man around me. I'm sick of hiding, these secret dates and all. Jules, believe me, I want to be with you too. Yes, I've wanted to for a long time, but if your husband found out about our meetings, he'd bury me alive in the ground. The blonde laughed softly. He has long known everything, but always forgives me a little pranks. Why? Because. Sorry, this is a very sensitive subject. Let's get out of here and go to our nest. I can't. I'll be right back. My wife's there. I can't. Wait till tomorrow. Sandra didn't wait for the end of the conversation and went back to the hall unnoticed by the lovers. There was an open terrace in the restaurant where the drunken crowd was having fun. No one paid attention to Sandra and she slipped outside. The light breeze cooled her down a bit and she began to think about her next steps, but all the plans were too bold for her to realize. Nothing? I'll tell him what I think tonight. The girls were already asleep and Sandra thanked her neighbor, who sometimes kindly agreed to look after the little naughty girls. A large cash bill quickly disappeared into the folds of the elderly lady's clothes. Sandra, thank you, by God, it cost me nothing to do you a favor. All the more I am pleased to do it, because your little girls are very obedient girls. Most kids today are spoiled, but your little girls are always obedient and polite. And little Lily even calls me grandma, it's so nice. The neighbor was set for a long dialogue, so Sandra had to say goodbye to her. Yes, your help is invaluable and we will definitely turn to you and my husband if the girls have no one to leave them with. The door of the neighboring apartment slammed shut and the woman breathed a sigh of relief. But no sooner had she gone into the nursery to admire her sleeping daughters than footsteps sounded near the door. Sandra immediately guessed that it was her husband and the sound of his footsteps did not bode well for her. Finding his wife in the hallway, Cameron gave her an angry look. Why did you leave? Why did you leave? I was sick of watching this feast of mockery. You could have warned me. You could have warned me. You could have, but you didn't want to. Yes, I did. How are you talking to me? Cameron, I'm not your subject or your serf. I'm sick of this. I'd had enough of being ruled by you. Don't you? The man didn't take his eyes off his wife which didn't promise a quiet evening either. Since when did you become so independent? Why so bold? Because I saw you making nice with the chief's wife with mine own eyes. Ah, you were following me. Okay, you want the truth? You can have it. I have no choice but to seat my male needs on the side. Because you're like an Egyptian mummy in bed. You're no good and your borscht and cutlets are getting on my nerves. Offensive words of her husband slapped her face. A thick lump rolled up to her throat and Sandra felt that she was choking. Cameron, but you're taking it out on me. Are you a brainless sheep to blindly obey my every word? But I thought. I thought and I thought. This conversation is over. It's a good thing you found out today. The end of our family drama was inevitable anyway. Go make your borst somewhere else, although you can stay here as a housewife. Cameron laughed evilly in her face. Think about that option. I hope I've made myself clear. Yes, except for one little thing. You forgot about the children. The man wrinkled his nose as if he had a sudden toothache. You can stay in my apartment for the time being, but I don't have time to babysit my daughters. Even though I love them very much, Cameron disappeared behind the bedroom door, but reappeared a moment later. He tossed a pillow onto the living room couch. You'll sleep here tonight. This is your punishment for disobedience. That night, Sandra didn't sleep a wink. She scrolled through the chronicles of yesterday, remembered the beginning of their family life, but never realized when the process of destruction was started. She no longer doubted that her softness was to blame. In the morning, Cameron, as if nothing had happened, he got up at the usual time and said in a cheerful voice, Wife, where is my breakfast? Sandra, too, rushed into the kitchen out of inertia. It took her only a couple of minutes to prepare an omelet with grated cheese. 
Her husband loved that dish. To avoid facing her abuser, Sandra closed herself in the bathroom and turned on the shower. Through the sound of the water, she heard the front door slam. On the kitchen table was a piece of paper on which her husband's hand had written a few words. I'll be late. You don't have to cook dinner. Sandra's eyes went black. Trying not to wake the girls, she began to take out her anger on anything that came to hand. Thank you, master, for letting me not cook you dinner. It's a good thing you're late because you're better off with that blonde than your wife. She doesn't stink of borscht like I do. Sandra half whispered, taking out her years of anger on milk cartons, canned peas, apples and cabbage. She used a knife to shred the food with a kind of ferocity and then sent it into the garbage can. The splatters flew in different directions and soon colored juicy rivulets flowed from the walls. As she let off the steam, the woman was pleased with her work. That's great. Now I have to do the same for everything that gets in my way. As my mommy likes to say, it's the beginning. Rose understood without words when she saw her daughter and her granddaughters on the doorstep. Sandra's eyes were burning, and her demeanor showed that she was excited. Meet the guests. Of course, my precious ones. Come in. Husband, look who's here. Henry kissed his daughter and granddaughters. The girls immediately began to pester their grandfather with questions. Will we have our own room, Grandpa? Will you buy us toys? Of course, you'll have everything. In Grandma and Grandpa's house, you can even walk on your head. The girls squealed with delight and immediately began to carry out Grandpa's instructions. Rose helped with the packing. Sandra, are you here for good? Yes, I thought I'd take your advice and start from scratch. You know how builders have an expression for zero cycle, and in my life, it so happened that yesterday I destroyed an old building, even the foundation was torn apart. Now I have to build it all over again, but I'm not afraid, even though I know it's gonna be hard. It was right to leave him. Cameron will be lost without you. Mom, he found a replacement for me a long time ago. I don't think there's another woman like you in the world. No woman would put up with an asshole like Cameron. But don't worry, you won't be lost with us. And we'll help you find a job. I've got some ideas about that. That's interesting. Let's see what you got in mind, Moni. Remember Lindsay Stark? Remember our town's first cooperator? She's in desperate need of employees. She's not doing so well. She's got a lot of loans, and her bar is barely making a profit. She thinks it's a loss. The next day, Sandra was already on the staff of a local diner. The diner, which owned Lindsay, was located in the bus station. But the establishment had a bad reputation in the town because they're from early morning to evening crowded fans of foamy drink. The owner was happy to see Sandra. Oh, thank you, Sandra. Everyone's running away from me. I don't like the conditions. You'd think I'd be satisfied with these skewed faces, come at noon and dawn, and beg for a loan to let them go, and then forget. Word's willing woman laid out all the nuances of work in an institution of this type. But Sandra was not frightened by the difficulties. A few weeks she studied the peculiarities of the work, and then said to the hostess, And why do not you sell baked goods? You could even organize a hot meal here, because at the bus station there is such a flow of passengers. Lindsay looked at the new employee with a condescending glance. You have a Barbarossa plan. Sure, it looks good from the outside. But what do I get out of the pies and salads? Believe me, a lot more than I make selling beer. Look, I've done some calculations. Sandra handed the landlady a notebook full of figures. She asked in surprise. Are you familiar with this business? Not much. Two years of college, then the same number of years at the university. I wanted to become an economist, but it didn't work out, but I still managed to get some useful knowledge. That evening, a satisfied Lindsay beckoned Sandra into the back room. I've been studying your chickest notes. Why do I say that? Because those numbers look like a cipher, like they do in the spy movies. Of course, I don't understand this science very well, but I trust you. My situation is dire. I need to fix it now. I totally agree. But tell me. Where are we going to do all of this? It's going to require additional staff and space. Sandra began to explain her plan. We'll rent the space. Yes, we'll need extra money, but we can rent the shop by the hour at the restaurant. I already checked. It won't cost much. I know about your difficulties, and I can take the loan on myself, and the staff do not need to hire yet. I'm a college graduate, and I even have experience working in a cafe in the capital. The hostess looked at Sandra as if mesmerized, 
and then enclosed her in the vise of her embrace. You are my salvation. The woman was so emotional that she couldn't hold back her tears. I had already stopped believing in goodness, but it turns out that there are still people who are ready to give a shoulder. Sandra, God sent you to me. Although not everything went smoothly at first, especially annoying bureaucratic obstacles, Sandra believed in success. One evening, Henry remarked, Mother, I've been admiring our daughter these days. In a good way, of course. The young woman laughed. Dad, that word always has a good meaning. But I had no idea that my person could delight. Rose supported her spouse. And you do not laugh at your father. I completely agree with him. You really, after you threw your banker, became like a man, blossomed, prettier, in the eyes of a light burning. Dad, you've praised me so much. Aren't you afraid that I'll become conceited? No, that's not typical of you. When you were a child, you fought for the truth, defended the weak, and it's nice to see the old Sandra now. So go ahead, my daughter, you might start your own business. This phrase, accidentally said by her father, is firmly planted in the brain of the innovator. Previously, she never thought that she could run her own business. It was because of insecurity. But the first six months on Aunt Lindsay's job had shown her that it could be a real challenge. Later on, the owner of the place herself began to speak openly about it. Sandra, you can't be a backroom girl. I still can't believe that my beer hall has turned into a respectable establishment. The drunks, of course, are not happy about the change, but their opinion is the least of my concern. But the moms with their kids are coming in. And old grannies like to shop here. But what I like best is the name Aunt Lindsay's Pie Shop. It's succinct and beautiful. The owner did not exaggerate Sandra's merits, indeed. Without her help, it would have been impossible to do such a job in such a short period of time. Sandra was already treating the establishment as her own brainchild. The initiative woman became known in the region and one day a newspaper correspondent came to them right in the middle of the working day. He clicked his camera and asked a lot of questions and at the end of the conversation he asked, Sandra, why don't you open your own business? She thought for a long time and then honestly answered, over the past year, my life has changed so abruptly that I do not have time to turn over the chips. I just hadn't given the question much thought. Just a few days later, Lindsay showed up at the pie shop in high spirits. You guys won't believe this, but I'm getting married. If anyone thinks that at my age, it's a shame to organize a personal life and she's serious. It should be done without regard to the years. I've been so lucky for the first time in my life. The staff, and it was mostly women of different ages, ahahal and ahahal. And the cleaning lady even said in her heart, People, if someone's got a shot at Lindsay, maybe I'll get one. I'm like that model on the runway. The woman walked through the hall, wiggling her hips and waving a mop. Everyone laughed heartily at the colorful number of the cleaner. But it was an ostentatious laugh. What's going to happen to us now? Lindsay, if you leave us, I don't think the new owner will want to keep us. Girls, don't get discouraged. You are not going to get discouraged. I assure you that you won't end up on the streets because your new owner will be Sandra. So please love and welcome. It was so unexpected for everyone that the spacious room was so silent that the hum of the refrigerator seemed like the roar of an airplane. But it was Sandra who was most shocked. She tried to object to the hostess, but she invited her into her office with her signature gesture. I wanted to surprise you so much and I think I succeeded. Sandra, your jaw dropped down in amusement when I announced my decision in front of our team. The woman was used to the fact that her hostess's vocabulary consisted mostly of phrases not used in literature. What struck her most was the tone with which she was now uttering them. Lindsay's whole being was imbued with sadness. You wouldn't believe, Sandra, how my heart is torn to pieces. I've grown attached to this town and my bar. Ugh. I'm sorry, but I can't let this last chance slip away either. You want to be happy at any age, and I met a decent man. Maybe we'll make a model family with him. It's a pity that my darling lives in the far north, but my son has settled there. So if things don't work out with my new husband, I'll live out my life with my son. Of course, Aunt Lindsay, you'll do fine. But you could sell your business for a profit. I could, but I can't trust my business to just anyone. Yes, I can. And you're the one person I have 200% confidence in. I'll do my best to justify your trust and I hope you'll come visit us. It took a few days to finalize the legal details. 
According to the terms of the deal, Sandra had to pay her former landlady an almost symbolic sum. You've done a good deed for me and I'd like to repay you in kind. After all, not everything in this world is measured in money. I really want things to get better for you. Lindsay sincerely wished the log success, and the words of this kindest woman were heard in heaven. Becoming a full-fledged owner of the pie shop, Sandra began to plan the expansion of the business, and soon she bought a small restaurant, which was located near the pie shop. The more successful Sandra's business went, the more friends she made. Mostly, they were men who sought to win the favor of a single woman. Of course, some were annoyed by the success of the businesswoman. The list of bitter enemies of the woman turned out to be in the parents of her ex-husband. When Sandra disappeared with the children, Cameron believed that she would return. Nothing will crawl to my feet and will still be baiting like alms that I took her back. My wife is not adapted to an independent life. She cannot do anything. And with her education, she punched only in what a diner to get a job. Such predictions Cameron gave in the company of friends on rare outings in nature. With the wife of the boss, he did not get involved from purely scurny motives. But Sandra's place was quickly taken by a young employee of his bank. The man kept in touch with her parents, so he was aware of the case of his runaway wife. When he learned that she had taken a job in a bar, his joy knew no bounds. I told you I wouldn't be surprised if she married a farmer or a chauffeur. Cameron's celebration was short-lived. Sandra filed for divorce and alimony. It was a turn he certainly hadn't expected. In a burst of emotion, he dialed his wife's number, but she abruptly cut off the flow of his swear words. Cameron, now you and I are going to settle everything through the courts. Oh, I almost forgot. The apartment was not only bought with your money. In case you haven't forgotten, there's maternity capital, so your daughter has every right to a part of the capital's living space. I hope you won't dispute that fact. The banker was unpleasantly surprised by this news. But then from his parents began to come in quite stunning information. When he learned that Sandra, in addition to the pie shop, bought a restaurant, he had a fit of rage. Where did that miserable woman get the money from? She couldn't. She couldn't buy anything without my permission. And here's a whole restaurant. There's only one way to do that. The old way. But it works. I'm going to break the horns of that benefactor who's sponsoring my wife. While saying this monologue, Cameron forgot that Sandra is no longer legally his wife. The woman herself did not even guess what plans of revenge nurtured her former spouse. She tried not to think of him, and if the past inadvertently broke into dreams, she woke up in a cold sweat. The girls also rarely remembered their father. The eldest went to school and Lily went to kindergarten. That year winter began suddenly. It had been drizzling rain since the evening, and in the morning it was freezing, and by lunchtime it began to snow. In a matter of hours, huge drifts grew in the streets. Sandra stayed late at the restaurant and hurried home, but for some reason she felt uneasy. Someone invisible whispered to her that she should check out the pie shop. To cheer herself up, the woman said out loud, It's not far, only 200 meters. I'll go check it out just in case. God forbid there's a short circuit or something. Gusts of wind blew in her face and Sandra had to walk the short distance for half an hour. But as soon as she reached her destination, a new surprise awaited her. She saw a human figure on a bench, almost completely covered in snow. It was a man and he reeked of booze. My God, he's going to freeze. You can't drink yourself into oblivion. She began to shake the man who didn't look like the local drinkers. The man was wearing an expensive coat and a branded pair of shoes. And the unpleasant odor of unexpectedly, the latter answered and in a faltering tongue, Nothing. And who? For your information, I came by cab because I wanted to find the little person here. Where'd you get so drunk, Scott? Do you even recognize me? The man took a long look at her face and then sobered up. Sandra, I've been looking for you, but I've been very well received here. Scott struggled to get up from the bench and looked around in surprise too. It turns out that while I was asleep, winter started. Am I an ant or a dragonfly? Sandra laughed. We'll figure it out later. Be thankful I found you. You'd have frozen to death on that bench before morning. Rose was somehow not surprised to see Sandra in the company of a frozen Scott. Oh, what's going on? I didn't mean for this to happen. And here, Mom, please be a little more specific. Daughter, don't swear at me, but Scott called me. And when he heard you divorce Cameron, 
he decided to come over. His life's not going well either. He'll tell you all about it later. Rose rushed to rescue the frozen guest, and Sandra couldn't help but marvel at her mother's resourcefulness. It wasn't until the next day that she was able to have a normal conversation with Scott. Not only was he freezing outside, but he was feeling very ill. One thing Sandra realized for sure, Scott had simply fallen in love with this hospitable town with equally hospitable residents. They were the ones who had gotten him so pumped up, albeit at his expense, but that didn't matter. After a hot soup and a mug of strong tea, the man was sweltering. Sandra spread him out on the couch and covered him with a blanket. Rose sighed. Such a good man and so unlucky in life. Mom, what's wrong with him? I can't believe that you've been talking to him for so long you don't know anything about him. The woman waved her hand. I do, but I don't know the details. Mom, Scott got married, started his own business, a lucrative one, some kind of restaurant or cafe. And when things got good, his wife left him and left him without a business. Don't think he doesn't drink. It's just something came over him, but he said he's not gonna give up. Starting from scratch means starting from scratch. Mom, you're so worried about him. Sandra, come on. You know Scott's a good man, and if he just... Mom, I'm not saying anything. How's work going? Sandra sat down tiredly. You know, I can't say it's bad, but... Mom, her mother sat down in front of her. It's like there's something missing, like a twist, or I'm missing a detail that's right in front of my nose. Sandra, I feel like you're missing something. Sandra, I think you're being too picky. Sandra, in such a short time, your restaurant has become one of the best in the city. Sandra put her thumb up. That's right, Mom. One of the best, and I want the best. Rose smiled, recognizing my daughter, and you know what I'll tell you. If you want it, you're bound to get it. I know you. Thank you, Mommy. I'm going to bed. I want to get up early tomorrow. The cook has a grandson. She's taking the day off. Okay. Go to bed. Good. From the doorstep, Sandra turned around. Mommy, how are the girls? I must be a bad mom. The girls are fine. Don't worry. And you're a good mother. It's just hard for you now. All alone and alone. And my father and I don't understand anything about it to help. Sandra hugged her mother in a rush of feeling. What would I do without you? Early in the morning, she kissed the sleeping girls and ran off to the restaurant. There was a lot to do and soon she forgot about everything. Cameron threw his shirt in his new girlfriend's face with annoyance. I don't understand. Is it so hard to throw the shirts in the machine and just iron them? The girl calmly threw the shirt on the floor and continued to put on her makeup. Finally, she pulled herself away from the mirror. Probably not. Cameron was furious. Of course not. Then I don't understand why you won't do it yourself. Then I don't understand why you won't do it. He choked with rage. Me? I have to wash my own shirts? Not me. In fact, I've been thinking. I'm not happy with all this. Cameron watched with huge eyes as the girl quickly threw her things into her bag and sent him a kiss. This just could be happening. How could it be? Someone out there and just take off on him like that. No, it was all Sandra's fault. She was the first one who dared to do something different from what he wanted. Cameron found a clean shirt in the depths of this closet with great difficulty and exhaled a sigh of relief. It had probably been ironed by Sandra, and then he was so furious. He should be suffering here, and this is a little businesswoman. It would be ridiculous if she, an illiterate fool, this business also brings money. Though her mother said Sandra had blossomed and the girls were well-dressed, Cameron didn't want to believe that for some reason. He was absolutely sure that if he called Sandra, she would immediately come crawling back on her knees. Except that wasn't the plan either. She would have to crawl over and apologize, and he would forgive of course. But not right away, and he'd have to make some rules for her. Cameron fancied himself thinking up rules, but then he shook himself. You might not even make it to work on time. As soon as he got to the bank, he was called in to see the chief. Cameron was surprised and even grimaced. He didn't really want to talk to the man who was the husband of his, albeit former mistress, but there was nothing to be done. For now, Cameron was still a servile man, though he had Napoleonic plans. May I? Come in, Cameron. Cameron went to the table and only now saw that at the table in the corner of the office sits Jewel and smiled at him. 
It gave Cameron a chill. She's just what he needed. It wasn't a pretty breakup, or rather, it wasn't pretty. Cameron's head was already spinning. He just found out that Sandra had filed for divorce, and then there was Jules. Well, it's a dream come true. I can move in with you. Cameron was dumbfounded. Cameron looked at her dumbfounded. You mean you're going to leave your husband? Of course I am, honey. We've talked about this so many times. He wrinkled his nose like a toothache. It's true what they say. Beauty and brains are incompatible. And you're going to work. Jewel fluttered her eyelashes in surprise. Why? Well, I doubt that your money bag will give you a generous parting gift. But for me to stay where I am is out of the question. Jewel stared at him for a while then said, So you don't want me in your life? Jules, think about it. But Lisa was already carried away. She screamed so that Cameron grabbed his head and just pushed her out of the apartment. To be honest, at first he was very worried. She complained to her husband and then what? But it didn't seem to bother him. Now, watching her in the chair, he realized it's nothing like that. People like her don't forgive. Cameron, I have an offer you can't refuse. Cameron tensed up. I'm listening. We need to help our office. It's not that far away, only 300 kilometers from Chicago. Cameron snowed. That's it. They're gonna send him to some shithole and forget him. Don't worry, it's only for a few months, and then you can go back to your job. Cameron realized he had no choice, so he waved his head doomfully. But the surprises didn't end there. He stayed there for almost six months, coming to the apartment on weekends, sleeping it off, scrubbing up because hot water outages were the norm where he was forced to be. He knew that some young employee was temporarily performing his duties and was sure that he would fail him in all this work. But he was wrong. The young employee not only did not screw up his work, but made some adjustments that were to the liking of his boss. Anyway, when Cameron came back, he was given a handshake. I'm sorry, Cameron, but your successor is doing a much better job than you are. Sorry, Cameron. What am I supposed to do? You promised me I'd get my job back. You don't think I put you back in your position at the expense of the bank. You can't. You can go back to your old position or look for another one if you don't like it. Cameron wrote his letter of resignation in full confidence that he would be fired, but of course that didn't happen. He blamed Sandra for everything, absolutely everything. He had a thought in his head that he should go and see how she was doing, especially since he had children there. Cameron liked that thought. He even called his mother. Oh, Cameron. I don't know if you should come. Sandra's doing very well. I don't think you'd like it. What do you mean she's doing very well? Tell me her diner is making a good profit. Cameron laughed, but his mother didn't cheer him up. She's got more than one restaurant now. I know she's got one in the next town over. Cameron choked on his saliva. Mom, does she have a rich patron there? Somebody's got to tell a fool what to do. Mom didn't even get a chance to say a word before Cameron threw him out. It doesn't matter, though. It's time to visit his daughters and his wife. To look her in the eye. She's been on my payroll for years. And now look at her. He didn't say anything else. He just hung up the phone. Sandra. Cameron suddenly turned around. What does he have in his life? Nothing. Not even a position stripped from him. Not even any of the ladies around him. Of course, as he was on the horse, so interesting to everyone. And as a little fell down. So all pass by and pretend not to know. Sandra was so busy that day that she forgot all about Scott, but he didn't forget about her. He came to her restaurant at lunchtime. Can I sit here in the corner? Sandra smiled. Sit, of course, if it's not boring. I don't have a chef's banquet today, so I have to get around. Scott resolutely took off his jacket. Do you have anything to change into? Sandra looked at him in amazement. God, I'd forgotten you were the best chef ever. Scott frowned modestly. Well, I guess you're exaggerating, but I can do some things. In the evening, tired and both happy, they accepted praise from the visiting guests. One of them approached them when everyone was leaving. I live in another city, but I really liked it here. What if I invite your team to my mansion? Everything to prepare for an anniversary for about 100 people. As you can imagine, money is not a problem at all. Scott and Sandra looked at each other, and the woman immediately thought that it would be immediately you can buy a new oven, many other things. After a couple weeks, Sandra decided that it was necessary to ask Scott after all what their plans for the future were. 
Sandra, I don't know what to say. Let's talk like adults. Sandra blushed for some reason. Rose immediately rushed off to do something important. Okay, let's. She realized that talking at work wouldn't stop everything, but she was ready. Every day Sandra realized more and more what mistakes she had made. Scott had once been the complete opposite of Cameron. Lily and Lizzie were literally never far from him when he was at home. If they never even tried to approach their father with their problems, then Scott was approached without any shyness. Sandra, you know there's a reason I called your mom. I didn't just come here when I found out you left your husband. I realized that. I wish I told you right away so I wouldn't be dragged down by reticence. When I saw you, I realized that nothing's ever really gone at all. I still want to look at you and admire you. You know, maybe it's for the best that there's nothing holding me there anymore. I'd like to start all over again from when you and I first met. Sandra stood up, walked over to the window. I don't know what to say to you right now. Scott jumped up. There's no need to say anything right now. Let things be the way they are. I'm not asking for an answer. It'll come to me. And about everything else. I'd love to work at your restaurant. Sandra approached him a couple months later. Scott, he understood. He put his arm around her. I'll make you and the girls happy, I promise. Cameron continued to look for work. The money was disappearing at a disastrous rate. Now he didn't understand how Sandra managed to run the house on the money he was giving her. No, he wasn't a cheapskate. At the time it had seemed to him that he was giving away very substantial sums of money, but now he realized that in order to live normally, one had to dodge somehow, and he had long since gotten used to such things. At last his luck turned to him, but not with his face. He was offered a job as a small clerk in a bank. Do you even know what position I was working in? Of course. Of course, that's why we made it easy for you. If you don't like it, you can keep looking. You have to understand, a bank is not the same as a bank. And it is one thing when a young, inexperienced employee comes and we will invest in him what we need or a person who is used to work in a different way comes to us. It's very difficult to retrain. He had no choice but to accept. At least he had time to pay the rent. Then he remembered that the apartment was part of the court granted share to Sandra and the girls and that Sandra could claim her share at any time. Of course, he didn't believe that. But his mom had told him some strange things about his ex-wife. Towards summer, he finally got ready to go back to his hometown. He didn't know why he was going, whether to visit his mother or to see Sandra. The fact that he had children there Cameron remembered only in conversation with colleagues. All the way there, he made plans. How he'd take her down morally. Obviously, for a town this size, any diner is good. Of course, he would gladly rub her face in all the flaws. As luck would have it, his way ran through the square, where the restaurant was renovated. Money was tight, though Cameron wasn't going to pay. Would Sandra have the conscience to take money from someone who fed and clothed her for so many years? He parked, looked around. It was a good location, not far from the movie theater, the park. The traffic was good. I wondered if Sandra really did it. Cameron's teeth chattered and he clenched his fists. But you'll regret it? You'll regret it, won't you? He pushed the door open with determination. Sandra, the vegetables are here. They're bad. Mark doesn't want to sign that they're bad. And Sandra raised her hand. Okay, Lee, be quiet. Lena was the new manager at the restaurant. A young girl, smart, with a personality. There was only one flaw. As soon as she got nervous, she'd rant so loud that no one could stop her but Sandra. Calm down, I'll go and talk to Mark. Oh, Sandra. Oh, Sandra, if only Scott were here, he'd give him a hard time. But you know Scott's out getting new furniture for the banquet room. I know I can't wait till he gets here. Sandra was hurt on one hand that so much hope was pinned on Scott, as if she didn't mean anything anymore, but on the other hand it was a very good thing. She would have to leave the restaurant for a while and this way, she would be completely at ease. Scott would be able to handle it at all. The woman rose heavily from the table. She was still two months away from giving birth and she could barely walk. She felt better when she was carrying the girls. Maybe she was younger, maybe it was the girls. Mark saw her and it snowballed. But what man could argue with a pregnant woman like that? He sighed sadly, signed some paper. Mark, you promised me that my restaurant would only serve the freshest food. Where am I going to get the freshest? Where am I going to get the freshest? 
and where am I gonna put the old stuff? But we're paying you well, above market price. What? Just for you to bring us fresh ones. Yes, I remember, but I have to try and sell my products. I'll send my son in an hour. He'll bring another. Sandra smiled. But what can you do with him? All the time he needs an eye and an eye. She returned to the office, just wanted to sit down. But immediately in the office again appeared Laya. Sandra. What now? There's a visitor demanding to see you. At the table behind the curtain. What's going on in there? Lee shrugged. I don't know. He seemed happy. At least it's all eaten. God, what a day today. Sandra went into the hall. She'd had a headache all morning. The girls at home had the flu. It looked like she wanted to be sick. And she couldn't be sick. She has a son who won't like it. Sandra stroked her stomach, smiled, remembered how Scott had reacted to the news that they were having a baby. For a while he stood there just looking at her, then he knelt down and pressed his face against her belly. I thought I'd never hear words like that again, even somehow made peace with it. Thank you. She walked down the hall, climbed the three steps, and froze. Cameron was sitting in front of her, smirking. Something was beginning to stir in her soul that made her bend her shoulders and pull her head in. But Sandra quickly came to her senses. That's all I need. She doesn't depend on him, and Cameron is nothing to her. Cameron, what are you doing here? I just came to see what uneducated gray women are up to these days. He saw her belly. He saw her belly. He grinned wider. What didn't you calculate while you were courting your virtues? Sandra felt nausea coming up her throat. This has nothing to do with you. Why did you call me? You've changed. You've gotten meaner. You've learned to growl back. Cameron, I don't have much time. He's up. That's how it is. You used to have all the time in the world for me. Then tell me, what did you like about it? The truth? You ran away from the truth? But what you really are is you're a dumb, ugly, ugly little bitch and you're nothing in bed. I don't know what you're offended by. The nausea stopped unbearable, but Sandra smiled in response to the words of her ex-husband. It seemed to me, or in your words, squeaks envy. Have you seen yourself, Cameron? The shirt is not fresh. The pants have blisters on the knees. Maybe some people wouldn't notice, but not me. What about your perfection? You're always perfect. But you're surrounded by dorks, or maybe you're not so cool anymore. She wanted to leave, but Cameron grabbed her arm hard and painfully. Where? I haven't told you to go yet. Let go. It hurts. Sandra jerked her hand away sharply, and Cameron brought his face closer to her. It seems to me that you owe me a lot of things. Cameron, let me go, do you hear me? You're nothing to me. You have no right. He squinted angrily and abruptly let go of Sandra. She couldn't hold on to the top step and flew screaming downwards. The height wasn't much, but here was her position. Sandra fell right at the feet of her husband, who came and went looking for her. Sandra. The man knelt down on his knees. An ambulance quickly. The staff ran towards him as well, and Scott raised a heavy look at Cameron. It's you. Cameron backed away. He knew the man from somewhere, he just didn't understand where yet. Cameron realized he had to run. He'd better hide now. He didn't have time. Scott's fist met him on the last step. You're gonna answer for this. You're gonna answer for everything. He ran out of the restaurant, but no one chased him. Sandra fell into the darkness, then floated out of it. Her stomach ached so intolerably that she wanted to scream. Patience, my dear, a little patience. Rose took the girls. Henry said he would meet his ex-brother-in-law properly. He said he had the strength to get him down the stairs. Sandra smiled weakly. Daddy can. The pain pierced her whole body again. Be patient, dear, we're here now. Someone was talking over her. Then she was being wheeled somewhere. She felt a prick in her arm and immediately felt very light. Sandra closed her eyes. Scott was out of breath. He paced back and forth in the hallway until an orderly yelled at him. But why are you walking like a pendulum? Does that make you feel better? It doesn't, and you won't let me mop the floors. He looked at the old woman in confusion. I'm sorry. And sat down. She came up to him. Wife? Yes. Don't worry. We have very good doctors. Thank you. The phone rang in my pocket. Yes, it was Rose. Scott, how Sandra? The woman was crying. I don't know anything yet. She's in surgery. 
Scott, that bastard Cameron, he set fire to the pie shop. How? Well, they caught him, but they couldn't save the pie shop. No one was hurt. No, it was nothing. Scott, you call me as soon as you know anything. Okay. He just disconnected the call when the doctor appeared at the door. Scott stood up and stared at him in silence. But why are you staring at me like that? You should be watching your wife. Fifteen minutes later and you wouldn't have saved her. You've got a kid. Premature, of course, but he's strong. He'll gain weight quickly, so don't worry. Scott exhaled noisily and Sandra? And Sandra will be fine, but you won't be able to have children. We have three. Well, that's good. Scott suddenly stepped toward the doctor. Thank you. Thank you. He hugged him, then grabbed Rose's cell phone. Baby, it's okay. Sandra's fine too. And we're gonna build a new pie shop that's way cooler than the first one. Sandra opened her eyes and immediately remembered what had happened. She put her hand to her stomach and froze in horror. Immediately, her husband's smiling face appeared above her. Don't worry, everything is fine. Our son is alive and will soon be perfectly healthy. Scott, Sandra, you know. He took her hand in his. When I realized that I could have lost you, I immediately thought that I don't need anything here without you. What's my point? I love you so much, so much that I didn't even know it. Sandra smiled. I love you too. They were not discharged until a month later. Sandra was a little nervous. Scott had only been around for a few minutes lately and then ran off somewhere else. She couldn't figure out what was wrong. Then this morning she saw on the news that her pie shop had burned down a month ago. She was furious. Why hadn't he said it anything, but she'd give him a hard time at home. They were driving down some strange road. Why are we driving here? I want to show you something. It's not the remains of a pie shop. Scott turned to her. How long have you known? This morning. I just didn't want to worry you. The car stopped. They were standing in the square, her restaurant visible just a little in the distance, and next to them a small building with a nice sign that read Pastry Shop by Lizzie's. As you realize on the other side of town, Pastry Shop at Lizzie's, Sandra felt tears forming in her eyes. Scott, you. Scott hugged her. Am I forgiven? Sandra snuggled into this chest. Why was I such a fool not to marry you in the first place? Why? We'd all make mistakes in life, but if we don't hurry up, it'll be our last. Rose is going to kill us because she was almost up all night cooking and the girls were helping her. Sandra laughed, looking at her son who was sleeping sweetly. Yes, we have to go, because our grandmother is strict. A week after they returned, there was an opening of the pastry shops. Sandra was nervous, but Scott was completely calm. He now knew that nothing would ever destroy the happiness of their large and strong family, and on top of that he brought two pastry chefs from the capital. He had forgotten to tell the line about it, and now he was afraid. Just a few days ago there was a trial. Cameron confusedly said that it was his ex-wife who brought him to such a state. He explained that she had taken away his good fortune and in fact she should be tried, and Sandra suddenly stood up. I want to drop the lawsuit. I want him to live free. Scott only then did Scott realize how much Sandra had punished Cameron. At first he didn't understand such an impulse, and when Cameron stopped beside them and said, So you, you uncouth redneck, made it so I owe you now? I hate you. Scott stood up and Cameron quickly headed for the door. Scott looked at Sandra. She finally smiled. Well, let him suffer a little. He won't be around much longer anyway. Scott laughed. You are a dangerous woman. Sandra smiled back. I'm just the most loving and loving. Casey knew that one day this day would come, but she didn't think it would be so soon. As recently as last week, she'd heard the shopkeepers whispering quietly that their shop would be closing soon. But the woman did not pay much attention to such conversations because she believed that she was exceptional. After all, nowadays such times have come that cleaners everywhere are a shed of gold. In fact, it is the most sought after profession. All out of their skin out, trying to get ahead in the bosses and ride on the floor with a mop no one has no desire. That's why in just a dozen years the profession of a cleaner has passed into the category of scarce. Such thoughts warmed Casey's soul and allowed her to believe in a stable financial situation, at least for the next five years. She mentally encouraged herself. I'm not likely to get a piece of bread from anyone, 
except for those fussy bimbos who'd be down for a bucket of rags. Casey cast a kindly glance in the direction where the young shop girls were gossiping. The girls were discussing something too loudly and didn't give the cleaning lady even a passing glance. Although Lady Casey had never experienced social discomfort this time, she was hurt by the youth's dismissive attitude. To make up for her loss of moral humiliation, she strode so close to the company that her wet equipment caught the tanned legs of one girl. She immediately bounced aside. Could you be more careful? What a habit of mop waving. Casey was not embarrassed or embarrassed. She slipped into the back room with an indifferent air, still mentally praising herself for her ingenuity. No one can prove I did it on purpose, but it put those dolls in their place. They pretend to be anything but empty inside. She filled the bucket with clean water and was about to return to the sales room to continue her important mission. When the girl whose feet she had used a floor cloth looked into her room, the girl remained at a safe distance just in case and addressed her as an object without gender or name. The landlady wants you. She told you to run away immediately. First the girl disappeared from sight, and only then the door slammed. The cleaning lady mumbled. Yeah, the culture here is really lame. Okay, I'm going to go to the carpet. Casey had gotten a job here right after her retirement, and her best friend Lucy had put in a good word for her. After years of work in the library, the woman could not imagine herself as a cleaner, so Lucy had to spend a lot of time and effort to convince her friend of the advantages of this profession. Casey, don't even think about it. You don't know how many people want the job. The salary is modest by today's standards, but in your position it will be a decent bonus. I take the job myself, but my health won't allow it. Lucy was exaggerating about her health, because during the day she could drive all over the neighborhood. For a while, restless Lucy went to organizations, offering people goods of dubious quality. Then there was a period when Lucy sold lottery tickets, but there the business did not go too well and the woman in time to get off. However, she was not bored for a long time because someone from her acquaintance helped her to get a job at a bread and butter place. Lucy was so happy that she did not hesitate to disturb her friend at 10 o'clock in the evening. She appeared in person and solemnly declared, Casey, this is my dream job. You have no idea how excited I am. I had a second wind. As her friend had not said anything concrete except enthusiastic exclamations, Lady Casey touched her forehead, just in case, and only then asked, Lucy, tell me what kind of work it is that you can break into a stranger's house in the middle of the night for. Lucy, like a good actress, paused for a moment and then said with the same solemnity, Now I'm a cashier in the restroom at the bus station. Today was my first day of work, getting up to speed. The shock was worse than the painful shock. Casey started giggling nervously in the hallway, but it was loud enough to get Lily's attention. Her daughter jumped out into the hallway in her nightie. Mom, what's going on in here? Are you sick? The question brought Casey back to normal. No, daughter, I'm fine. It's just that Aunt Lucy got a good job and decided to make me happy. Lily looked suspiciously first at her mother and then at her friend. Yes, it's not without reason that they say that everyone has his or her own cockroaches. Now I'm convinced that people have more and more of them as they get older. That night Casey also thought that her friend's brain was not alright if she was so happy about such, to put it mildly, not a prestigious job. But time had shown that prestige was nothing compared to profit. Lucy always, in addition to her main income, had a good tip. She could afford a manicure and styling once a week in the salon. Casey had already forgotten the last time she went to the hairdresser. She was used to denying herself a lot of things because there was always a catastrophic lack of money in the house. For this reason, she was clinging with all her four limbs to her job at the Everything for the Home store. The outlet was located near the apartment complex where she lived, which was also a big plus. The store was popular among the residents of the neighborhood, as the prices were lower than other outlets, and for employees there were benefits. In short, it was a real plus. Except for the owner, Nancy was a rather unpleasant person, and the store employees were frankly afraid of her. But to the cleaning lady Mrs. Nancy had a special, one could even say, a friendly attitude. This woman with a masculine character early widowed and single-handedly made her way to success. She had started out as a tent merchant and now owned several retail sites. 
the everything for the home store was the most profitable. Nancy had a dependent son and his family and had always been sympathetic to the difficulties of her subordinate's life. And now, as soon as Casey appeared on the threshold of her office, Mimi, Nancy asked good-naturedly, How is your friend in distress doing? Casey replied with a sigh, Yes, things are like soot, but nothing, slowly coping. I'm in the same situation. My son and daughter-in-law are getting on my nerves. If they could give them somewhere for a while, by God, I would gladly do it. I can't bear to carry them on my back. Lady Casey sat down carefully on the edge of her chair and gave her polite assent. Though her fate coincided with her mistress's in many respects, there was a marked difference in rank. So during the visit, the cleaning lady tried not to violate the etiquette of the house. She had time to study Nancy's character well and knew that something important would follow the long preface. Indeed, after a lengthy overture, the main movement of the symphony with the loud name of female unhappiness began. Nancy stared unblinkingly at her subordinate. Casey, we're going to make some big changes here, so I thought I'd give everyone advance notice so they can prepare. You already know about my family difficulties. Casey nodded silently, not yet understanding what her mistress was getting at, but she continued more cheerfully. For many years, I struggled with a whole family of idlers, tried to reeducate them. And the unbelievable happened. My son wanted to open his own business. Probably in the nearest forest, some animal has thrown off its hooves. But it happened, you know, Casey. I cannot help but go to meet him. Casey didn't yet realize how she was related to her mistress's son. But she answered, of course, I understand. Nancy, that's wonderful. Then you and I won't have any problems. The thing is, my Tony wants to open a machine shop. He's an expert at it. He's a university graduate, and since I don't have any money to spare, we've decided to convert this store. Casey finally understood the meaning of the hostess' words, and she looked at her hopefully. I don't care where I clean the floors. I'll clean your son's shop. Nancy remarked with annoyance. You still don't get it. My son will be hiring his own staff. Lady Casey persisted but he'll still need a cleaner, won't he? The landlady's face flushed red, and she blurted out in anger. I told you Tony's going to be hiring a whole new staff, so as hard as it is for me, I'm going to have to let the whole staff go. I've already offered the department clerks new jobs in other stores, only I've got you hanging in the air. In short, you have exactly one month to find yourself a new job. Casey realized that the conversation was over. She stood up and headed for the door. Thank you for the warning. The woman heard a sigh of relief behind her. No, she had no grudge against her landlady, but she thought she could take care of her. I've worked my ass off for almost four years, and I'm getting my gratitude. After work that day, Casey walked, but her legs didn't want to walk. She couldn't get the conversation with her landlady out of her head, and the future looked frightening. How would we live now? Lily's maternity leave had dragged on, and she had no plans to go to work although Joe was already in his fifth year. Son-in-law is also in an endless search and hardly brings any money into the house. The woman decided to have a serious talk with the household about further coexistence, but at home a new misfortune awaited her. Her grandson knocked over a cup of boiling water and his clueless parents did not know how to help the child. They were both rushing around the screening baby, afraid to approach him. Her grandson's screams were heard on the first floor, and the terrified grandmother did not wait for the elevator. She ran up, jumping over two steps. It seemed to her that her heart could not stand it and jumped out of her chest. Bursting into the apartment, she rushed into the kitchen where tragedy had played out. Joe was sitting on the floor with his hand as red as a crawfish claw. His parents froze nearby in human tenderness. Casey scooped up her grandson in her arms. Why are you standing there like two mannequins? You can't do anything. You cannot be trusted with your own child. In her grandmother's arms, Joe was quiet, only whimpering softly. She coaxed the boy. Be patient, my good. Now we'll go to the doctor and your hand will be treated. At least tell me how you got scalded. The boy whispered, I wanted tea. I see. And mom had no time. The grandson sobbed loudly, as if to confirm his grandmother's version. Lady Casey spent almost two hours at the health center. Lily ran to the medical center after her mother, but could not explain to the doctors how the accident happened. 
The doctor on duty listened to the young woman's rambling speech for a long time and then said with irritation, Mommy, you are obliged to provide your child with a safe environment. You've probably heard from your mom that little kids need a watchful eye. Lily shifted her gaze to her mother and muttered unhappily, How can I keep an eye on him if he's running around like an electric whirlwind? I turned my back for a second and he grabbed the kettle. Very often seconds decide a person's life. Try not to let this happen in the future. The doctor gave them a whole list of recommendations. Lily studied the list for a long time and then said with a wry grin, but now I'll have to go to the dressings every day. The young woman was about to say something else, but the dam of her mother's patience burst. Right in the corridor of the clinic, Casey told her daughter everything she thought about her and her son-in-law. You'd think you'd be working hard, leading an idle life, comfortably settled on my hump. Maybe it's time to become on independent rails. I'm not made of iron and concrete. I can and cannot stand. Anyway, look for a job. I'm being fired from the store. Lily rushed to her mother in tears. Mom, what are you saying? What work when Joe, your grandson, needs special care? Lady Casey was forced to admit her daughter's rightness. She clasped the baby asleep in her arms more tightly and said, already peacefully, All right, we'll think of something. Maybe Lucy will help again. Lily looked at her mother gratefully. Mommy, you're the best. If it weren't for you, we would have lost Hugh for sure. There was so much anguish on her daughter's face and her voice sounded so sincere that Casey mentally reproached herself for being cruel and callous. As she rocked Joe in her arms, she wondered who they could ask for help but their mother. As long as I have strength, I'll help. Brushing her hair, the woman did not remember that her son-in-law had both his father and mother alive. But Hugh's parents did not really burden themselves with the care of their son and his family. They lived at their own pleasure and every year recovered their health at resorts. For three nights, Casey did not leave her grandson, although the burns were superficial. The boy was in severe pain, so his mother and grandmother took turns carrying him in their arms. Caring for her grandson for a while pushed aside the problem with work. But the grandmother realized that the day X was inexorably approaching. She tried again to talk to her daughter and son-in-law, but Lally turned away from serious conversation and her son-in-law said, Casey, you're always telling me I don't have enough to eat and I'm doing my part for the family too. It's just that now I'm in temporary difficulties, so please don't artificially inflame the situation and don't pressurize me. If she could forgive her daughter some liberties, Hugh's insolence made her furious. Hugh, I'm not a horse to carry you all. You're a man, aren't you ashamed to sit on my neck? Son-in-law looked at her strangely and confessed. Why should I be ashamed? I am your daughter's lawful husband and I have every right. At this point, Hugh stumbled and waved his hand and walked out of the kitchen. It seemed to Cassie that a wall had grown between her and the young parents. She's banging on that partition. She wants to be heard, but the wall is rubber, so it absorbs all sound. The woman looked sadly at her sleeping grandson and whispered, Grandma and you will have to carry your cross alone. Casey strode into the hallway, where a telephone stood on the nightstand. She dialed a familiar combination of numbers and in a few seconds heard her friend's cheerful voice. Hello, Lucy's on the phone. Lucy, you're answering the phone like an expert telephonist. Casey, what are you doing up so late? I need your help. Can I come to you? Of course you can. You don't have to ask such a stupid question. Casey decided not to postpone her visit until tomorrow and took her coat off the rack. But she couldn't get away unnoticed because Lily was attracted by the commotion in the hallway. She poked her disheveled head through the slightly ajar door. Mom, where are you going at night? I'm going for a walk. Oh my gosh, who's gonna watch Joe? You will. You're the mom. Lily's drowsiness instantly vanished from her face and she stared at her mother. The door slammed loudly and the woman sighed and walked down to the first floor. There was a special atmosphere in Lucy's small apartment. Casey always felt cozy here. She used to stay at her friend's house often, but after Joe's birth, the new grandmother couldn't afford such freedom. Perhaps that was the reason why seeing her friend had become so dear to her heart. Lucy bustled about in the small kitchen. She ran from stove to table, saying, Hang on, my friend, I'll be ready in a minute. 
an artist shared this recipe with me, but I don't remember her last name. Casey grinned. I didn't realize that in a paid restroom, a visitor was sharing her culinary expertise in addition to her main occupation. The hostess shook her head disapprovingly. And you only want to tease me. The guest hastened to correct the mistake. Lucy, do not take offense. I'm in a kind way. Especially I am now in such a position that frankly envy you. The landlady sat down on the edge of the stool. Casey, come on, tell me, what's the matter with you? Did you have a beef with the store owner? I thought things were going so well with you and her. Yeah, Nancy and I are on good terms, but you know how accidents happen when you don't expect them. A suspicious aroma wafted from the stove, and Lucy mumbled as she rushed to save her specialty. Oh, my miracle pancakes almost burned. The woman deftly removed from the frying pan ruddy rounds and put a plate with fragrant pastries in front of the guest. Come on, help yourself, because on an empty stomach conversation turns out to be boring. Your misfortune, lady, is that you think of yourself in the last place, hence the deplorable result. Lucy took sour cream and a jar of jam out of the fridge. This is in addition to the pancakes. The guest ate with appetite, and the hostess looked at her thoughtfully. Casey, your barkers have finished you off. You'll soon be dragging your feet. I can't look at you without tears. Your head is a mess. Your hands are all wrinkled. I'm not even talking about your face, which has forgotten how to take care of itself. A few more years of such a busy life, and you will turn into an old woman. The guest philosophically remarked. Apparently, this is my fate. You know, Lucy, I've recently begun to think more and more often about the meaning of my life and realized that it is useless to try to avoid what is going to happen. Lucy was indignant. Listen to you, so you can immediately put on white slippers in the coffin to lie down. A wise man said that a man lives as long as he resists difficulties. Lucy, you have no idea how much I struggle, but just when I've recovered a little from one adversity, a new adversity strikes. Thank you, friend, for the treat. It was delicious. The guest with the plate went to the sink, but Lucy stopped her. Sit down, leave that stupid plate. I'll wash it myself. Tell me what's wrong. Soon, Lucy, I'll be out of a job. The owner is giving her store to her son, and he doesn't want to keep the old staff. Anyway, I've only got a month to find a new place. Casey, get your dependents to move. How much longer are they going to be on your ass? I tried talking to Lily and my son-in-law, but it's all for nothing. Lucy slammed her fist down on the table in a fit of emotion. You can't be nice to them. You should give them an ultimatum to become self-sufficient in a month. Again followed by a heavy sigh of her friend. I've been thinking about it for a long time, but now is not a good time for drastic action. Joe scalded his hand three days ago. It was such a shock to everyone. Lily's still reeling from it. Your daughter's a fake. She'll do anything for a sweet life at someone else's expense. The guest made a pleading plea. Don't swear, you're right about everything, but I can't make my own terms now. As soon as Joe gets better, I'll tell them everything. Just help me with my work. You get a lot of people in your day. Maybe you'll hear something useful for me. Lady Cassie stroked her friend's hand and looked pleadingly into her eyes. Lucy was a sensitive person and was touched. All right. We'll think of something. I can't make any promises, but I'll do my best. What kind of job would you prefer? I don't care. At my age, I don't have to choose. You know how people look at us ask you. The main thing is to have a little extra income. They parted well after midnight. Lucy urged her guest to stay, but Casey was worried about her grandson. Lucy, I'd love to spend the night, but I'm afraid that during my absence something else will happen to my underachievers. Well, run along. I'll call you as soon as I hear something. And I gotta tell you, girl, you're writing yourself off too soon. We're gonna fight you again. It took Lucy exactly two days to resolve the issue of her friend's employment. She called Casey before lunch and excitedly told her, I've got good news for you, but I'll tell you the details when I see you. After work, drop by my place at the bus station and we'll talk in confidence. Maybe we should go home. Lucy laughed. You are embarrassed by the place of my work. Remember, my dear, very many vital issues are not decided in high offices, but in such inappropriate places as the toilet. By the way, my place is perfectly clean. I have no trouble drinking tea and having lunch there. Anyway, 
I'm waiting for you. Casey barely waited until the end of the working day and hurried to meet her friend. Lucy did not torture her friend and after the words of greeting immediately outlined the essence of the case. I still yesterday threw a fishing rod. I have a friend, works at the labor exchange. She has all the lists of vacancies in the city. She told me that the office of the company Gilstroy urgently needs a cleaner. It's been empty for a while because the director's too picky. Imagine he had a real casting call and this is for a cleaning lady. I wondered how he selects accountants, drivers and other staff. Lucy was trying her hand at wit and didn't immediately notice the change in her friend's expression. But when she noticed how white she had turned, Casey rushed to her. Casey, what's the matter? Is your heart racing? Do you need some Corvalol? No, it's nothing. It'll pass. Just a little bit, though. Lucy had everything on hand and quickly pulled out her medicine cabinet from her desk drawer. Pouring into a glass of water the prescribed dose of heart medicine, she said. Well, you've done it. You scared me. Casey drank the medicine and returned the glass to his place. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. It's just that my Archie, my late husband, worked in this very company. Lucy Ivanovna shrieked and covered her mouth with her palm. I'm sorry, Casey. I couldn't even think. That's it. Then we'll call it a night. You shouldn't be in this office. Lucy, wait. I don't have a choice. The deadline my landlady gave me is coming up, and I'll be left with nothing. And I heard that after that incident, the company was bought out by some oligarch. Maybe I'm wrong, and there's another company with the same name. No, that's right. A friend of mine told me the same story. The current owner of the company, one Harry. Does that name mean anything to you? Casey thought for a moment, then shook her head negatively. No, it's the first time I've heard it. If you want, I'll find out the details. Don't, Lucy, I'm putting too much stress on you with my problems. I'll go to the office myself. Find out for myself. Thank you for your help. You're a real friend, and I'm very lucky to have you. The night city was fast asleep, and Casey walked down the deserted street and thought about the twists and turns of her fate. Though she felt a little better after her talk with Lucy, there was a thin thread of anxiety somewhere deep in her heart. No, she was not afraid for herself. Most of all, the loving mother and grandmother was worried about the future of her daughter and grandson. She mentally reproached herself. Lily is not at all adapted to independent life. It's my fault. I was constantly busy at work and did not devote much time to my child. The inner voice immediately objected. You had no other choice, Casey, and stop beating yourself up. She tried not to make any noise in the hallway, but Lily did creep out of her bedroom. It wasn't until her mother stepped through the threshold of the apartment, she whispered reproachfully. You showed up, not Dusty, Galona. Joe was cranky all evening, waiting for you. I'll catch up with you tomorrow. There's a reason I'm out looking for a job. Lily made a vague sound like a moo and disappeared behind the bedroom door. Casey tiptoed to her room. Despite her fatigue, she couldn't sleep because her memory kept jogging her mind with images from the past. Casey had not had much joy in her life, but she had been played by misfortune since her early childhood. She was the eldest in the family, and after her father left her for another woman, all the cares of her two younger brothers and sister fell on her fragile shoulders. To feed her children, her mother worked two jobs, and on weekends she went on shabashki. She was a painter and plasterer, which are always in demand. Cindy often told her eldest daughter, Take my example, go to school to be a painter, you'll always have a piece of bread. But Casey had other plans for her future. She wanted to go to library school. True, she could not share her intentions with her mother because she had a very tough character. Neighbors and acquaintances talked about her. Cindy has iron nerves and steel stamina. She is a man in a woman's form. Indeed, for many years Cindy steadfastly endured all the difficulties of everyday life but broke down when she was hit by the most terrible for any mother grief of losing a child. No, Harvey, the youngest in the family, did not die of a terminal illness. He had literally disappeared when he and his mother were traveling back from the city on the electric train. At that time, they lived in a working-class community, which was almost right next to the city limits. At that time, housing construction was going at an incredible pace, and his parents hoped to get an apartment in a new building but father never waited for this event and left to another family. 
so they got the apartment without him and his younger brother. But while the village was a separate settlement in the register, the most popular mode of transportation among its residents was the electric train. On that fateful day, Cindy went with her young son to the clinic to have the child immunized. She had to take time off work for this preventive measure, and the woman was very sad about it. She had her own clinic nearby. No, someone interfered with it, and they demolished it before its time. Now do you have to travel to the city every month to get a certificate for kindergarten or get a vaccination? And that's a full day's work for which no one pays me. Casey remembers offering her mother her help. Mom, let me take Harvey to the doctor. It's no trouble at all. Cindy immediately rejected the offer. How can you be trusted with a responsible business you'll open your mouth and lose the child or get lost? It was as if the woman had brought disaster on herself. After a visit to the children's clinic, she and her child were again rushing to the train to get home early. The woman forgot about everything in the world, and when they got on the car and urgently needed to leave for a small necessity, she asked her neighbor on the bench, Please look after my little tomboy, and I'll be done in a jiffy. The elderly woman gladly responded to the request. Don't worry, I'll watch the boy. But when Cindy returned, neither her son nor the woman was there. The train had made a brief stop during her absence. The distraught mother didn't want to think that the stranger, along with her child, had gotten off at that half station. The missing baby was immediately reported to the line police station. Harvey was first searched in all the nearby villages and settlements, then the search expanded, but weeks and months went by, and the boy was never found. This tragedy was the first terrible loss in Casey's life. Cindy became withdrawn after the incident, blaming herself for everything. The unfortunate woman voluntarily abandoned the usual life orientations and joined one community. Very soon the mother completely withdrew from the life of her children and subsequently quit her job. The eldest daughter tried to bring her parent back to life, but she responded to any remarks with aggression. We are all sinners on this earth and you are a sinner too, and your sin can only be atoned for through prayer. Cindy prayed day and night. She often left home for days at a time. Once she was gone for a month, when her mother finally showed up, Casey realized there was something mentally wrong with her. The woman was placed in a specialized institution. Periodically improved, she was released home, but the light intervals were short and the eldest daughter had to watch every step of her sick mother. It was good that by that time they had already received a large apartment in a new neighborhood of the city. The working village where Casey's childhood and youth had flown by had ceased to exist. The younger brother and sister did not want to stay in the family nest and moved away in different directions. Cindy herself soon passed away as well. She died at home on a quiet fall morning. Casey made breakfast as usual before work, headed for her mother's room. Wake up, Cindy. It's time for breakfast. But that call went unanswered. Her mother was lying on her side, covered from her head with a blanket. Casey rushed to the bedside. Anticipating trouble, she pulled the blanket down. Not yet fully realizing the depth of her grief, she screamed. Mommy, wake up. You're asleep. Cindy's hands were still warm and her daughter clung to them tearfully. Life was slowly leaving the body of the stricken woman. This was the second irreparable loss in her life. The brother and sister did not arrive until the day of the funeral. They stayed together the whole time and whispered about something but Casey was not content to watch her relatives. She put a lot of effort into seeing her mom off in a dignified manner. Thank you that there are still good people. Former neighbors in the village provided considerable help in organizing the funeral. Someone lent money. Someone took upon himself the organization of the funeral. Many kind words were expressed to the orphan girl. Casey, be strong. Time heals any wounds, and this pain will subside. Remember that you are not alone in this world, and at any time turning, we will help you as we can. The girl wanted to hear the same words of support from the closest people of her sister and brother. But they were guests at the morning ceremony and did not even deign to buy flowers to lay on their mother's grave. Nanny, Casey's sister, lowered her eyes and tried to explain this oversight. You realize, Casey, that it's a long trip, and a plane ticket isn't cheap. My husband didn't give me much money just enough for the trip. Nanny was seven years younger than her older sister, but she had already been married twice. 
The first marriage did not last a year, and she hurriedly separated from her husband with a student who was not able to meet the minimum set of needs of a young wife. Just a few months after the divorce, Nanny married her boss. She proudly told her older sister that the man had left his wife and child for her. Casey was horrified at such a confession. Nanny, you should know that you can never build your personal happiness on someone else's misfortune. The younger sister snickered disgruntledly. And you're the same way. That proverb makes me sick to my stomach. The women at work all ears buzzed. Now the older sister instructs. But you took the father away from the child. Doesn't that fact embarrass you? Nanny looked arrogantly at Casey. I'm not embarrassed. I'll give my husband a bunch of little babies if I want them. I think you're jealous of me, sister. After all, you're about to turn 30 and you're all alone. This conversation took place shortly before her mother's death. Casey had the urge to punch her little sister in the face, but she held back. Then her resentment toward Nanny faded, and she was genuinely glad she'd come to the funeral. But when her sister confided in her about the lack of money, Casey didn't hesitate to reach into her purse. She scooped out the rest of the money and held it out to her sister. Nanny, I've already spent a lot. I don't have much left. I think you'll have enough for the return trip. Her sister counted the money and didn't even thank Casey. After the wake, when everyone had gone, Nanny started from afar. Sis, you'll have to forgive us Billy for having this unpleasant conversation at a time like this, but we need to get some details straightened out before we leave. At that moment, Casey was washing the dishes. Her little sister's words made her wary. She turned off the water and looked at her brother, who sat at the table with an absent expression. It wasn't hard to guess what the conversation would be about, but Casey was intent on delaying the moment. We haven't seen each other much lately. Mom's been thinking about you a lot, waiting for you to get here. Nanny snorted Casey, your story sounds like fiction. Our mommy was in and out of the hospital. How could she remember anything or anyone? By the way, my husband still doesn't know my mother has a brain problem. I'm afraid if he finds out, he'll put me out on the street. He's a heredity freak. Billy remained silent as well. Casey found his sister's statement sacrilegious. Nanny, how can you say that? You know, mom's been in trouble ever since Harvey disappeared. The sister waved her hand carelessly. Oh, when was that? It's all excuses from early childhood. I remember our mom was often out of sorts. Casey had no sooner opened her mouth than Billy finally spoke up from his corner. Girls, stop fighting. Let's just talk about the main issue and get out of here. Casey asked with a chuckle. Didn't you come here to divide the inheritance? I can't wait. Nanny flashed her eyes angrily, and Billy blushed to the top of his head. Casey, you can think what you like. That's your right. But it's a question that begs to be asked. I mean, the apartment was for everybody, and Nanny and I are entitled to our share. And how much do you want for your shares? If I understand you correctly, you do not intend to live here. Nanny nodded affirmatively and said the amount, then added, If you don't have the money, you can sell the apartment or divide everything equally. Casey asked mockingly, Aren't you going to be sick, sister? You just show up like this and demand your share when your mother's body is still warm and you didn't lift a finger to help me. Billy had already recovered and said in a mentor's tone, But there's a law and it stipulates. I know the law as well as you do. We'll settle this matter in six months, but now get out of here, both of you. The brother and sister were bewildered by this pressure. They stomped around the kitchen for a while and then left for the train station without saying goodbye to their older sister. After they left, Casey puzzled over what to do, but a colleague at the library advised her. Casey, don't go after your relatives. I advise you to find a good lawyer and solve the issue of inheritance through the court. Be sure to attach all statements from the hospital where your mother was treated. With the competent conduct of the case, we'll be able to prove that your brother's sister is unworthy hairs. Of course, her conscience didn't allow her to take such a step. She had already begun to look for favorable options for sale or exchange when she met Archie. The young foreman came to the library and asked embarrassedly, Help me please because I'm at a complete loss. Casey was just tidying up the card catalog and the persistent visitor irritated her. And how can I help you? You see, we're having a seminar at work next week, and my boss ordered me to prepare a speech. I have never taken part in such events, so I don't even know where to start. I'm not a public person at all. I get lost in public. 
The guy suddenly smiled, and two dimples appeared on his cheeks. Casey felt ashamed of her unfriendly tone, and she said in a different way, The only thing I can offer you is newspapers. Every industry has its own publications where you can get useful information. Of course, I am not an expert in the field of construction, although my mother worked in construction all her life. The visitor immediately revived. And so, word by word, a rapport developed between the young people. That day, Casey first learned about the existence of a construction organization called Shilstroy. Her new acquaintance, Archie, spoke passionately about her work. The young man was a hereditary builder and was proud to carry on the work of his father and grandfather. But he had obvious problems with language and Casey helped him to compose the text of the speech. Archie never got a chance to demonstrate his oratorical skills. The boss took the prepared text from him and patted him on the shoulder. Thank you, Archie, I will not forget your help. The young foreman was shocked and intended to assert his rights. Austin, but that's not fair. I spent half a day in the library. I even had a girl helping me draft a speech. The boss clacked him on the shoulder again, but harder. You see what a good assignment I gave you. So you should thank me again. I take the text for myself, and I wish you to continue your pleasant acquaintance with the girl. And don't take offense at me. Your moment of fame is still ahead of you, because you are young, and my time is strictly limited. Archie had no choice but to accept this arrangement. He didn't want to argue with his superiors because these were troubled times, and those who expressed dissatisfaction could be quickly thrown out on the street. For this reason, most workers kept silent, hiding shortcomings and even serious violations of construction standards. Of course, the salary, which at all times was much higher for construction workers than for clerks and ordinary laborers, also kept them silent. In professional problems, Archie did not tell his future wife, and Casey immediately felt that Archie, her destiny. They met for only a month and a half and then filed an application. The girl immediately warned her fiancé. Archie, you know that I recently buried my mother, so we should not arrange a noisy wedding. I do not want people to judge me. So don't worry, I don't like unnecessary encourage myself, because family happiness doesn't depend on how much is spent on the wedding. Even before the painting, Archie moved into the apartment of his future wife. With all the hustle and bustle, Casey had forgotten all about her sister and brother. But Nanny remembered her inheritance and would not give up her share to anyone. She showed up just on the day when the newlyweds put their signatures in the registry office. The newlyweds decided to celebrate an important event in their lives with a small feast for two. And at the most important moment, the bell rang. Casey rushed into the hallway. It must be the neighbor who's come to congratulate us. But it was Nanny. The sister was wearing an expensive sheepskin coat and a mink hat in the tone of fur trim. Without waiting for an invitation, she went into the kitchen. Oh, you've got a party going on, sister. What's the occasion? The last thing Casey wanted to see on this special day was her sister. She answered her very dryly. It's none of your business. Why are you here? Nanny whistled. Oh, how you talk. She went to the table and poured herself some champagne. Nanny didn't like the drink and frowned. How can you drink such a thing? But the low-quality drink did work on the young woman, and after a small amount of the fizzy drink, the younger sister noticed that there was another person present in the kitchen besides herself and Casey. She pointed a manicured finger at Archie. Casey, what's that frame? That's a nice-looking kid. Are you with him? Casey wasn't going to stand for her sister's insolence. She took the bottle from the guests and said in a loud voice, This is my husband and you could have warned him you were coming. Nanny stared at Archie again. Sis, is your husband aware that this apartment is not your sole property? Archie decided to teach his relative a lesson in politeness. I hate to remind you, Nanny, that discussing a man in his own presence is highly unbecoming. Such behavior is considered unseemly. Nanny grimaced. What's that? You've picked up some fancy words somewhere. I'll put it simply. I'm not giving back what's mine. I don't care what you think of me. Casey could see her sister was in a belligerent mood. She had already prepared for a scandal, but Archie suddenly said, I think we can settle this apartment thing. I have the money and you, Nanny, will get your share, so to speak, in monetary terms. You and I will go to the notary tomorrow. Nanny shrugged her shoulders. What do I need you for? Just get me the money and be done with it. No, it doesn't work like that. 
At the notary, we'll draw up a document in full form and you'll sign it. I don't want to do that. Archie scrutinized his wife's sister. You can still solve the issue of inheritance through the court, but I do not think that this option you will like more. Nanny was puzzled. Can't we do without all that red tape? Give me what's due and I'll leave you alone. Casey decided to put a stop to this unpleasant conversation. No, sister, it won't work that way. A month or a year from now, you'll get the idea that the partition was unfair and you'll start bugging us. Against such an argument, Nanny had nothing to say. Disappointed, she stretched out. All right, have it your way. Can I sleep over? What a silly question. Of course you can stay. You can stay here until you get bored. The sister's answer won over the stubborn Nanny. She didn't refuse dinner and tea and cake. The next day in the morning, the sisters went to the notary. But it turned out that for the final solution of the inheritance issue, the personal presence of the younger brother was still needed. So Nanny left with nothing. On the day appointed by the lawyer, the sister came again with Barry. The brother immediately gave up his claim to this part in favor of his older sister. He explained his action thus. It was Nanny who confused me. It's embarrassing. Then I want to apologize to you, sister. You took care of us. You were like a mom and I acted like an idiot. I'm sorry. Casey was touched by her brother's confession. Nanny, on the other hand, saw it as personal revenge. Uninhibited, she lashed out at the boy. Barry, you were defective as a child and you're still defective. Who pulled you by the tongue? Took and all laid out could, for example, in my favor to give up his part. I'll never forgive you for that. So sister and brother parted as enemies. But after all the paperwork hassles, finally resolved the problem with the apartment. Later, the spouses privatized the housing so that from now on there were no collisions. Family life quietly flowed, overcoming domestic troubles. Money was enough not only for a trouble-free life, but also for the annual vacation. Archie was appointed site manager and began to think about his own business. He shared his plans with his wife one day. Casey, I haven't told anyone yet, you first. I'm tired of depending on others. I want to work for myself. The young woman always supported her husband, but here she felt an incomprehensible anxiety. Archie, well, you know better than me that the construction business is the most difficult and most dangerous direction. Archie laughed. You've been reading detective stories in your library. Many of my acquaintances have successfully mastered this business. One of my fellow students at the Institute said if you do everything within the law, then there will be no trouble. Archie was energized by the new idea and only started coming home at night. Casey did not grumble at the fate and said to her little daughter, Our daddy will soon earn even more money and we will all go on a trip together. The couple have long dreamed of visiting the most interesting places on the planet and the next vacation wanted to spend in Thailand. But these plans were not destined to come true. One frosty December day, an accident happened. Archie and several other workers were crushed at the construction site, snapped from the crane concrete slab. They didn't tell their wife until the morning. Casey stayed up all night waiting for her husband. When the phone rang, she immediately realized that a new disaster had come to their home. The management of the construction organization tried to cover up the accident and blame it on the victims themselves. The director of the company, sweating with excitement, and said to the widow of the head of the site, This is the direct fault of your husband. He is responsible for the technical serviceability of the crane and other equipment. Casey quietly, according to the rules of the man, lay down. The director blushed even more. What did you say? The woman replied just as quietly. I was just correcting you. You use the present tense and one should speak of the dead with the past tense. My husband is no longer responsible for the mess in your company. The director was speechless. She left the office, carefully closing the door behind her. That tragedy took the lives of four young, healthy men. Only two survived, but they were handicapped for life. The unfortunate widows, who lost their breadwinners in one day, expected to receive at least some compensation. But the management not only refused the women, but also treated them in a rude manner. After a short conversation with the director of the company, Casey felt terrible shame. She fled from the office, where she was smeared with mud, and saw nothing in front of her. There was only one desire, to get away from this place, and forever forget about the existence of this company. 
Everything was confused in the young woman's mind. She saw nothing in front of her. Casey had almost reached the middle of the roadway when a firm hand grabbed her and a polite female voice shouted in her ear. You crazy fool, where are you going? You've had enough of life. The yell was like a bucket of ice water. Casey came to her senses, shaken with terror. She looked gratefully at the woman who had saved her from imminent death. Since that memorable day, they had hardly parted with Lucy. Lucy, too, had had her own tragedy in life. Her husband died just a month after the wedding. The woman never told anyone the details of the accident. She didn't even tell Casey, wisely noting Casey, you've got enough trouble of your own. You don't need my problems. Believe me, it's over. It's painful. I may regret some things now, but it's too late to fix them. Only years later, Casey realized that her friend regretted that she had not allowed herself to be happy. As Lucy herself later admitted, she was afraid of repeating the misfortune and refused all the men who offered her hand and heart. This she doomed herself to loneliness, because then when she realized her mistake, men stopped paying attention to her. It was a particularly hot day in late May. The sun had been blazing since early morning, and Casey was feeling uncomfortable, not only from the heat, but also from the excitement. To collect her thoughts, she decided to catch her breath a little. Not far from the entrance to the building where Schilstroy's main office was located, she noticed a vacant bench. Her heart was racing for the first few minutes, but then she calmed down a little. It had been almost 20 years since her husband's tragic death. Casey hardly recognized the building, the memory of which for years had instilled panic terror in her. But now she looked at the site calmly and had no unpleasant emotions. Both the appearance of the building and the surrounding landscape had changed. An uplifting thought flashed through Casey's mind. Well, what are you going to sit like this since it came here? Go ahead and act. Just in case, the woman took out of her purse powder and looked critically at her reflection in a small mirror. It's okay, it's fine for a cleaning lady. After her conversation with Lucy, Casey paid more attention to her appearance, especially the words that the owner of the company, with a special bias, selects the staff. The assistant to the chief, not young but very polite lady, met the applicant for an empty vacancy. She offered the visitor a chair and briefly introduced herself. Leslie, I won't tell you my last name because you won't remember it anyway. I'm acting secretary here and I'm also in charge of human resources. The chief is temporarily absent, so I handle all matters on his behalf. Casey was confused and only stretched out meaningfully. Oh, Leslie smiled. You know, I'm surprised at myself sometimes, but modern life is such that if you get a little sidetracked, you fall out of it forever. I really don't want that to happen. Casey spontaneously burst out. I, too, am pleased to have found an understanding from the first minutes. I hope that our acquaintance with you will continue in a similarly positive way. So I'm listening to you very carefully. Miss Casey introduced herself and told about the purpose of her visit. Leslie listened to her attentively. But for some reason, she asked, Are you an educator by training? No, I graduated from library technology, but it was a long time ago. Does my former profession matter? The assistant smiled again. Don't worry, Casey, you have a good speech. That's why I asked you such an unconventional question. I myself was a former teacher of English language and literature, but at the end of the 90s, I was left behind. For a long time, I was looking for my new place in the sun. But the world is not without good people. Our chief's father helped me out of a disastrous situation, and now I can't imagine my life without this job. Casey was surprised by such frankness and realized that the interlocutor expects the same step from her. She told Leslie about the main points from her biography and finally added, I just can't afford to relax now, a little later. Maybe I'll want to exercise my rights and relax like normal pensioners, but I can't right now, Leslie. Leslie rolled her eyes theatrically. Oh, our children, we do anything for their well-being. I have almost the same situation, but the difference is that I don't let mine sit on my neck. I've culturally detached them. That is, I've separated them from me. I have a daughter and son, yearlings, live autonomously and quite coping, which I am very happy, but I'm always aware of it, so that I can give them my powerful shoulder in time. Leslie was a frail build, so expressive epithets did not match her appearance. She laughed ringingly at her own joke. Perhaps I am too distracting you, 
but in this office among rough men sometimes can be unbearably boring and you want to have a word with someone. This nice woman's face immediately became serious. So let's get down to business. If I understand you correctly, you don't mind working here as a cleaner. Casey stretched out. I really need a job. I've already been given a notice of termination by the landlady at my old place. The head of human resources interrupted the woman. I'm sorry, where did you work? At the home improvement store. I haven't paid my paycheck yet. Leslie's face lit up again with a smile. I know Nancy pretty well. You might even say we're buddies. By the way, her son Tony used to be in my class. He was such a smart boy. He wrote a very nice essay. Casey realized she'd better not talk about her mistress's problems. She and the assistant boss chatted a little more on distracted topics, and then Leslie handed her a blank sheet of paper and a pen. Well, Casey, write your statement. Try to start your life with a clean slate. Casey quickly accomplished the task at hand. Leslie listed her cleaning duties. The main requirement is to stay out of the chief's sight. To fulfill this condition, you will have to report to work early in the morning, that is, before everyone takes their workplaces off as staff. But you can postpone cleaning and at a later time, when everyone goes home. Whatever works best for you. But I have to have a clear schedule on my desk. We have very strict discipline here. Casey could not yet believe her luck. She agreed to everything the assistant manager of the company said. Leslie escorted the new employee to the elevator. Yes, I almost forgot to tell you that our Harry is a very pedantic man and God forbid, if something or a piece of paper is not in the place where it should be, since you will have to restore order in his office, be sure to take this into account. I like you a lot, and I'm rarely wrong about people. Casey returned home in high spirits. She felt as if a heavy weight had been lifted from her shoulders, and it made her breathe easier. The change did not escape her daughter's attentive gaze, and she asked anxiously, Mom, what's the matter with you? You don't look like yourself today. Casey changed her stylish shoes for room slippers. Daughter of today, I'm starting my life with a clean slate. Lily moved closer to her mother and sniffed the air with her nose. You didn't happen to have a hundred grams with Lucy for courage, did you? Daughter, you know I don't drink at all, and even less in the morning. It's just that today I met a wonderful woman and I'm getting a job. Lily squealed with joy. Mommy, you're awesome. Casey gently released herself from her daughter's embrace. Your excitement is premature, because from this day forward, our lives are going to be on another level, like a computer game. Lily guessed it. We've been stuck at the beginning for a long time, so it's time to go higher, that is, to raise the level of our lives. And what that means. What it means, Lucy, is that everyone has to take responsibility for themselves. You're 26, thank God. That's the age of maturity. Joe's his own boy too, and his wounds are almost healed. Mom, you know that. Casey forcefully drew her daughter to her and kissed her on the tip of her nose. I know all that, my dear, but the grace period is over, and I have no more bonuses in my stash. You've got a husband to make a move. After all, your Hugh has parents and they're not poor. Let them help you out a little. I'm not the only one who is broke. There were sobs. It meant that the daughter was using her most effective tool to influence her mother. Mommy, mammy, that's so cruel of you. We need at least a little time to prepare. The positive mood, like an ethereal substance, began to fade away, replaced by a familiar tiredness. Casey, by an effort of will, drove away the gloomy dejections and said rather sharply, Lily, stop whining. You Hugh had a whole six years to prepare, but you were doing quite different things. Thought I forever and will obediently pull this shank. No, my dears, finita la comedy. I think you know the phrase, you don't need a translation, but for purely human reasons I'll give you exactly one month. There was horror in her daughter's eyes, and Casey hesitated for a second. But then Leslie's words came to mind and the mother said to her daughter rather rudely, Lily, don't. You're not doing the very good scene tonight. I'll give you some purely feminine advice. Kick your husband good or look for another life partner. A normal man should provide for his family, not live off me. Why are you so upset? It's not like I'm chasing you out on the street. You live, but you pay for all your pleasures yourself. Casey admired her courage. If she had a tambourine in her hands at the moment, 
she would have hit it with all her might. Lily froze in place and looked hopefully at her mother. Mammy, what about Joe? Lily, this is just another attempt at a pet peeve. You're wasting your time because this technique doesn't work on me anymore. Besides, it's not like I'm giving up my grandmotherly duties. Everything stays the same, except your status changes from slackers to employed. Do I make myself clear? Lily grumbled. It's as clear as it gets. Casey headed to her room to rest after a busy day. Lily stood in the middle of the kitchen for a long time. She was trying to figure out what her mother's ultimatum would mean. Her thoughts were jumbled in a high-speed world, but at one turn one thought came off the orbit. Lily, you're going to have to cook dinner yourself tonight. Then you have to wash Joe's clothes and take him for a walk. The young woman wandered to the sink, whispering to herself. God, this is terrible. I can't stand it. That day, too, was a turning point for Lily and her family. In the evening, when he was in his usual comfortable state, his wife expressed a number of complaints to him, but from all the flow of beautiful and not very ethical words, the young man realized that Lafa for him ended. For the first time in years of married life, Hugh did not sleep at night. He was trying to resolve the dilemma, accept his wife's conditions and go tomorrow to look for a job or find another, more cooperative life partner. The second option chronic slacker averted immediately. He realized that he loves his wife. His love may not be the same as everyone else's, but he definitely loved Lily and Joe. The man whispered doomfully, I'll have to look for a job. It was the last living thought, and then Hugh fell into sweet sleep. Summer had slipped away, and the first signs of fall were in the air, the odor of fallen leaves and rising humidity. But Casey didn't notice these changes because her life was back to normal. She quickly settled into her new job, and after a week, she was alternating between morning and evening shifts. Leslie approved of the arrangement. And you are well done, a rational decision you chose for yourself and it is convenient for me to coordinate the work of the office. By the way, Harry immediately noticed that his office was cleaner. He even asked me to thank you on his behalf, which I am happy to do. The first praise emboldened the woman and she shared this joy with her friend. Lucy remarked reasonably, You see, I've gotten you a good job. But don't get too excited. This Harry is a dark horse. He is a man, a mood, and there is no telling what will go through his head tomorrow. The hopeless situation in the house has moved on. The tenants, as Casey called her daughter and son-in-law, had dropped their cocoons. For a couple of weeks they didn't speak to her, expressing their displeasure in this way. But then the game of silence bored them. One night, he met her in the hallway. Casey, I want you to know that I'm already working. I've been promised a small advance. Very good, Hugh. The woman felt that words of approval were never too much to ask. Let Hugh know that she was not his enemy and rejoice in his successes. Casey thought about all the recent events and the seasons of the year while relaxing in the yard near the playground. Suddenly she caught herself thinking that she had been thinking especially often lately that youth too, like a warm summer, flies by in an instant. Before you know it, old age is on the doorstep. The woman tried to switch from these unhappy thoughts to more pleasant thoughts and the most important stimulus in her present life was her grandson Joe, who was digging in the sandbox with the other kids. At the sight of this happy picture, the woman felt a surge of energy. She called out loudly to her grandson, Joe, don't get dirty. You have not forgotten that we were going to go to the park with you. The boy quickly jumped out of the sandbox and at first wanted to wipe his hands from his jeans, but then changed his mind. Grandma, but my hands are dirty. Can I go to the park like this? They'll say I'm dirty. Casey reassured the child. It can be fixed. We'll clean it up. She reached into her purse for a wet wipe. Give me your hands. Grandma will give you a good scrubbing. We don't have to go home because of this trifle. The boy's plump lips stretched into a satisfied smile. No, we'd better go to the fountain and wash up there. Joe, if everybody starts washing their hands and feet in the fountain, it'll be a mess. How's daddy at work? The woman's hand and the napkin are frozen in the air. Your daddy said that? He also said the job sucked and he wasn't a slave on a plantation to bend over backwards for cents. Casey decided she didn't need to question her grandson further, but in her plan, which she'd always kept in her mind, 
She made a note to do some educational work with Joe's parents. The woman thought, is it possible to discuss such matters in front of a child? And then we grab our heads, wondering where the little ones pick up such words. Joe looked at his grandmother expectantly because his hands were still covered with a layer of sand. Casey caught herself. Joe, you're giving me a headache with your fountain. After a thorough hygienic procedure, the grandmother and her grandson went to the park. In this favorite place of rest of the citizens has recently been carried out a large-scale reconstruction, after which the park looked even more attractive. To saturate the site, the administration decided to install slides, miniature swings. Older kids could practice their climbing skills on the rock climbing wall or organize competitions between scooters or skateboarders. Joe had been a lively child from an early age, and he was attracted to moving types of entertainment. Casey wasn't surprised when her grandson dragged her to the far corner of the park. Grandma, let's go there first, and then you can buy me ice cream. Okay, Joe, today I'll grant you any wish you want, but just you don't take one step away from me. The boy was willing to do anything just to gawk at the virtuoso guys who were skateboarding up and down at a cosmic speed. Joe was not alone in his desire. A dozen or two spectators of various ages gathered near the low fence, and spurred on by the general interest, the athletes decided to show the public the aerobatics. Joe quickly found a friend in his hobby, a boy about the same age, with long curls. The unusual hairstyle made the child look like a little prince or a type of his majesty of men. Casey involuntarily admired the baby and was distracted from reality for a few seconds. And in those seconds, something happened that made all the spectators scatter. Only the boy with the appearance of a prince stayed where he was. And Joe was running away. It all happened in a split second. From the side, Casey saw a young skateboarder flying toward the child. Apparently, the kid miscalculated his speed and flew off the track. Of course, Casey didn't know the intricacies of this extreme entertainment. She understood only one thing. The unknown boy was in danger. Forgetting her age, her aching lower back, the woman thrust her body towards the flying projectile. Although the impact was quite strong, Casey stayed on her feet. She cradled the crying boy to her, and Joe asked in a pitiful voice, Grandma, are you in a lot of pain? It took her a moment to realize what her grandson was asking. As calmly as possible, she answered, I am not hurt at all. The grandson, choking with delight, began to tell what he saw from the outside. He flew so fast, I'll tell Daddy tonight. You're a real lifeguard, just like in the cartoon. Someone behind me touched Casey's people on the shoulder. Woman, are you all right? If it wasn't for you, the boy's head would have been blown off. This kind of fun can only take place behind an iron net. The perpetrator of the accident and his vehicle disappeared behind the trees. And the unfamiliar boy was still clinging to Casey. She asked him, Who did you come with? Although the first fright had passed, the child's voice trembled. With mommy. And where does your mommy? The boy pulled the woman aside. There's my mom. She's waiting on the phone again. Grandpa's told her how many times she'll be headless before she knows it. But mom doesn't listen to anyone, not even grandpa. From the intonation, it was not hard to guess that the child was obviously imitating someone. The young woman continued to chat on her cell phone. Only for a moment, she was distracted from the conversation, shifted her attention to her son. Pashka, where are you walking? I told you to sit next to me. This indifference of the young mother angered Casey. Mommy, your child just a few minutes ago was in danger and here you are calmly chatting on the phone. The woman threw disgruntled into the receiver. Sarah, sorry, have to disconnect. There's a crazy on here who's been ganging up on me. I'll call back later. Turning off the cell phone, the mother grabbed the child's hand with such force that the baby squealed in pain, but the parent dragged him away. I'll show you at home how to disobey your mom. I don't need bad aunts telling me what to do. You'll be punished for being a LL. Casey looked at the couple and did not immediately notice that she was holding the Panama of the child she had rescued. She shouted, Mommy, wait, you forgot. The young woman stopped, but didn't even take a step toward her. Casey covered a short distance and gave the mom the child's headpiece. The culprit took advantage of the moment and broke free from his mother's grasp. He pulled something brightly colored out of his pocket and held it out to the savior. My name is Chippy, 
and this is my horse Victor. Grandpa says he brings good luck. Joe tugged his grandmother's hand. You promised to buy me ice cream. Casey put the boy's gift in her purse machiniatically. Joe, how impatient you are you can't do that. The boy parried. I'm little, I'm allowed. When I grow up and become like daddy, then I can't be spoiled. Probably won't be allowed to eat ice cream either. The good mood returned to the old woman and she reassured her grandson. You can enjoy ice cream at any age. I buy ice cream for myself too. But you're an aunt and uncles can't have ice cream. Joe, don't be silly. Even generals are allowed to eat ice cream. The boy gave up the browbeating chant and ran to the place where the cold treat was sold. Tired from the adventure, having had a lot of impressions, they returned home toward evening. Joe was burning with impatience and immediately told his parents the story of his grandmother's rescue of his new friend. He accompanied his story with gestures and loud noises. Lily waited until her son had finished talking and turned to her mother. Mom, you had to distinguish yourself. I'm surprised you didn't hurt yourself. Casey rubbed her back. I guess I'll still have some bruises. That thing did a number on my back. Good thing the guy who was riding it jumped off before it hit me. Hugh looked at Casey for a long time, then said sarcastically, Yes, we still have heroes. Our courageous women are ready to catch fire, water, and skateboard on the fly. Bravo, Casey. And his colorful speech was followed by a round of applause. She realized that Hugh was not yet able to calm down, but she had no strength to answer his teasing. More than anything, Casey wanted to lie down and stretch her legs. She had already settled into bed and was in the mood for sleep when she suddenly remembered little Chippy's present. Taking the trinket out of her bag, the woman gasped. It can't be. No, it was just a dream. The drowsiness was lifted like a hand, and her eyes became cloudy, as if she had fallen into a fog, the first from the past, burst into a song, like a counting song. Mom used to sing such an unusual lullaby to her children. She sat clutching the old toy in the palm of her hand. It seemed to her that time stood still as a black shadow on the windowsill. An unpleasant nausea came to her throat with every breath, and to get rid of this uncomfortable feeling, the woman opened the window. A cold autumn wind blew into the room, but it cooled the heated imagination. Is it just me, or am I really losing my mind? Casey remembered her mom who had passed away so early in life and whispered, How could this toy have gotten to the boy? Could it be a copy? She once again scrutinized the wooden whistle made in the form of a horse. This is the same horse that. The wheel of time turned back abruptly, and Casey was back in the working class village where her childhood had flown by. The main attraction of their little place was Grandpa Buddy. No one knew this elderly man's last name or middle name, but legends were told of this heroic past. Some even claimed that Buddy was a commander of a partisan unit and was awarded the Star of Hero. True, no one had ever seen this award either. The old man was strange and led a secluded life. He went for a walk every day in company with a pink piglet. The piglet had a dog leash around his neck. Buddy would give him commands, amusing the crowd. Tommy, show me your rack and how you bake for food. And now, my boy, say oink to everyone. Surprisingly, the piggy obeyed all his master's commands. Buddy made such performances only on big holidays. After demonstrating the skills of this pet, he went to the beer bar, where he disappeared until closing time. Not infrequently, the drunk old man would get a little disorderly. But the guards didn't take the old man away. They felt sorry for him. Nothing let a little drunk old man, he deserved it, because he does not hurt anyone. Indeed, Buddy was very kind and generous. When he got his pension, he'd buy candy and give it to the kids. But another oddity of the old man was his unusual craft. He made toys out of garbage and gave them to children. Casey and her friends often visited Grandpa Buddy. In those years, it was very popular to help adults, and school children helped lonely people with household chores. One day, the class teacher asked them, Girls, do you know Grandpa Buddy? The girls reported, We do, Annabelle. And you know that this man has awards because during the war years, he made many feats. Again, followed a positive answer. And the teacher got to the point. This man is very lonely, and you, as young helpers, can help him. 
The girls did not let the teacher finish and, interrupting each other, began to offer a variety of options for help. Some promised to mop the floors in Buddy's house, and others wanted to make soup for the hero. The teacher approved of both options, but warned her students. Girls, no amateur acting. If Grandpa refuses to accept you today, arrange for another day, ask when it is convenient for him. The whole team of girls went to visit the hero and his trained piglet. Buddy greeted the welcoming crew and invited everyone into the house. Hardly had the girls crossed the threshold of a modest dwelling, as frozen with surprise. Everywhere were toys brightly colored, unusually cheerful. They stood in a neat row on the shelves of the bookcase, and some hung from the ceiling beam on a rope. Schoolgirls instantly forgot about the purpose of their visit and began to look at the toys with delight. Of course, the guests flooded the master with questions. Grandpa Buddy, what do you make these toys from? The old man was embarrassed by the attention, so he answered briefly. From different kinds of wood. There is a lot of junk in the forest, I pick it up. The main thing in this business is to see something different in a log. For example, I made this cockerel from driftwood that was lying in the ravine behind the old stable, and this dog I made from twigs. That first excursion was a trip Casey would remember for the rest of her life. The impression overwhelmed her, and she decided to tell her mother about the hero's visit. But Cindy yelled at her daughter, Don't you dare go there again. Grandpa's had balloons over the rollers for a long time. He's gonna get in his head, and your teacher's not even smart. You can't send your kids to a crazy grandfather. I'm gonna get the principal. Cindy didn't say what she'd be doing when she went to the principal's office, but Casey knew her mother was not a woman to be trifled with. She was very afraid that her parent would fulfill her promise one day. Cindy was busy with household chores. Harvey's baby brother had recently been born, and his father had left home a month later. The woman bore the grief in silence because she had four to raise alone, so she had no calf tenderness. If the little ones got something from their mother, Casey got mostly pokes and nudges. She decided not to talk about Grandpa Buddy anymore, but she went to see him secretly. Casey wanted to learn how to make toys just like him. Of all the girls, she was the most diligent student. Buddy taught her to make a cockerel and a hen, but Casey kept her eyes on the little horse that could be whistled. The old man made it for her and blew a hole in it. That's how funny it turned out. Maybe I should give it to the police department because they don't have enough whistles. Casey got it. Grandpa Buddy, please give me a horse. I have a little brother and I didn't give him anything. There's plenty of toys at the store. You can buy anything you want, even a car, even a whole railroad. We don't have money for toys. Daddy left us and mommy has to work hard to feed four mouths. I even went to school in my old uniform this year, and everyone laughs at me. That's the trouble. All right, Casey. Take this horse for your Harvey, but don't let Carapoo swallow the toy. The girl clutched the present to her breast and ran home. Her younger brother liked the homemade toy at once. Harvey squealed with delight and even tried the wooden horse for a tooth. Only Cindy didn't share the children's joy. Her face was darker than a cloud, and she glared menacingly at her daughter. You didn't listen to me after all, going to Buddy's. Casey didn't make excuses, but boldly looked her mother straight in the eye. He's good in everything they say about him in cancer. Suddenly, mother laughed. What do you know? She's a protector. Okay, tomorrow you'll go to your grandfather. Take him some pancakes. I'll bake them today. Casey was surprised. Why? Because you have to pay for goodness with the same coin. The old man's lonely. Nobody cooks for him. The next day, Casey took Buddy to the innkeepers and got another toy in return. Between the old man and the girl began a real friendship. True, these warm relations were not long. One day, during another visit, Casey found the old man crying. When she asked him what was wrong, he replied bitterly, My piggy's gone. They took him away. As soon as I imagine what they'll do to him, my heart bleeds. Casey was afraid to even think about the piglet's fate. Without thinking, she organized her girls. They went to look for the missing animal. The schoolgirls went all around the village, but no one saw the trained piglet. The old man was so overcome with boredom that he abandoned his craft, and he did not let guests into his house anymore. Towards spring, the news spread through the village that Buddy had died. Keeping heroes to all settlements and ahead of the procession went policemen in dress uniform, 
carried on the paths of the Order of Hero and among the awards stood out the Gold Star. Many village children still had toys made by the old master. After the piglet disappeared, the old man gave away all his roosters and kitties to the children. Harvey did not part with his conic even when he grew up a little. He was only two years old when he learned to whistle. The sound most of all amazed the boy. He often put on concerts at home for his sisters and brother. Cindy did not interfere with the young talent. On the contrary, she watched her youngest son with tears in her eyes and said, He's just like his father, just as rambunctious. That day, when Harvey went with his mother to the city to the doctor, he took with him this favorite horse. Along with the toy, his brother disappeared without a trace. More than 40 years have passed since then, but Casey remembers that fateful day forever. She even remembers that in the morning it rained lightly, and her mother forgot to bring an umbrella. Casey walked them to the driveway and wanted to run home to get the umbrella. But Cindy said, Don't go back, daughter, it's bad luck. Harvey and I are not sugar-coated. We won't melt in the rain. The weather cleared by noon, but Mom came home alone. It had lightened up considerably outside the window. Casey still sat staring out into the misty distance. In her hand was a burgundy-colored wooden conic. It was not the right color for such an animal, she thought. Grandpa Buddy had also painted the toy an inappropriate color and explained with a smile. There is a bird that makes dreams come true, and I have blue horse. I would love to paint him a different color, but I'm all out of paint, only blue left. Memories of the past calmed and warmed the soul of the old woman. She realized that she had to find the boy Chippy and learn from his mother how the unique toy fell into their hands. Lucy tried different professions in her long life. After school, she immediately entered a trade school, but quickly realized that she could not look a customer in the eye and at the same time to weigh him. Her fiancé worked as a bus driver, and Lucy also caught a desire to drive a big car. She even enrolled in a course to learn how to drive a trolley bus, but after the tragic death of her young husband refused this unsafe venture. And then Lucy, by acquaintance, got a job in a restaurant. In times of widespread scarcity, it was the most enviable profession so Lucy was friends with big bosses and simple housewives. In the restaurant industry, Lucy lasted until the 90s, and then everything went downhill. Like mushrooms from under the ground began to pop up new people who bought up everything on which their eyes stopped. Their restaurant was also bought by such a hatchling rich man and immediately began to reshuffle the staff. He called each employee to his office and in two minutes decided the fate of the person. He also asked Lucy just a few questions. How old are you lady and what else can you do, except for making requests and registration of delivery notes? Lucy honestly admitted, I don't know anything else. New ones, the restaurateur pointed at the door, I don't need such inept people. I'm going to have a high class club here and beautiful girls will be performing and you don't have a marketable look at all. I'm not a potato to be judged on my looks. Lucy slammed the door loudly, wishing the new owner a quick ruin. Besides financial losses, she also wished him to get dog lichen. There were other wishes, which are not customary to talk about. What happened to that creep? Lucy doesn't know, but she heard that the restaurant she worked at lost customers and went bankrupt. The safety cushion Lucy had built up over many years was not enough for long. Endless monetary reforms had done solid damage to her wealth. There was a period when she was so squeezed that she was happy to take any job. Once again, Former connections helped. At one time, Lucy worked at the post office in the mail distribution department. Then she finished her courses and went for a promotion to a well-deserved retirement. The whole department saw Lucy off, gave her a lot of expensive gifts and wished her a happy vacation. The woman was happy about her new status for a short time, only two days. On the third, she got bored and she called Casey, who had two more years to go before going on a well-deserved vacation. Casey, I'm bored with everything. I want to work. And Lucy's life went vertically upward. After many trials and errors, she finally found the job of her dreams. The woman was not embarrassed by the specifics of the activity because the salary was dripping on her card and she had a lot of free time. That fall day, Lucy was burning with boredom. She counted the proceeds several times, but time was still moving very slowly. In her heart, the woman rambled. I wish Casey would call. When she started her new job, she dropped off my radar. 
As soon as she said those words, the cell phone buzzed. Lucy pressed the green button with a manicure finger. Hello, Lucy speaking. In response, she heard her friend's angry voice. Lucy, maybe you should stop acting like you're not sick of it. Why are you so angry someone kicked your tail or the new boss yelled at you? Really, I came to you on a serious matter, and you all jokes. S. Fur prolongs life. You should know that. Believe me, I'm not laughing right now. I want to cry. Tell me what happened to you again. You're not a woman. You're a real disaster. That's why I'm calling you. When can I come over to your place? The friends agreed on a time to meet, and Casey, with heavy thoughts in her head, began to clean up. She remembered Leslie's instruction and tried not to disturb the order in the office of the chief, whom she had never seen before. Noticing dust on the racks of thick file folders, she began to carefully wipe the shelves. Suddenly something sharp pricked her hand. The woman noticed a glint of glass between the folders. Her hand reached for the object, which turned out to be a picture frame. The photograph was also present in its proper place, but as soon as the woman looked at it, she felt a chill go through her. In the picture was the same little boy she had saved from harm yesterday. The child's hand was held by a tall, gray-haired man in whom something seemed painfully familiar. She froze, unable to take her eyes off the photograph for some reason. How long she stood like that, she didn't know. She awoke to footsteps approaching the office. Casey nimbly put the photograph down and began to dust it off. The door opened and she turned sharply. It was the man in the photograph. He looked at her in surprise, and Casey said hurriedly, I apologize, I'm a little late with the cleaning, I'm just leaving now. The man silently nodded his head and walked to his desk. Casey walked to the door on unbendable legs. When she had already grasped the handle, the supervisor clicked it open. Casey, if I'm not mistaken. She turned around. Yes. I want to warn you that I don't like to be cleaned up in front of me. Under other circumstances, I would have fired such an employee, but in view of the fact that you're doing a very good job, I can't help but recognize that. I'll forgive you for the first time. Casey nodded her head, though inside she was seething because she really wanted to answer this show off. I hear you. I'm sorry. She closed the door quietly behind her and pressed her back against it. Why was her heart pounding so hard? Was she excited because of the catch-up? Yeah, no, more like because of that boy in the picture. Casey realized she just had to figure out where they got that toy from. It could be a similar toy. No one just made those. How to do that, she had no idea. So she looked at her watch and hurriedly grabbed her mop. She really needed to talk to Lucy. She always knows what to do, and even in the most desperate situations will find a way out. In the evening, the friends sat at the table. Lucy drank tea and looked carefully at Casey. Casey, everyone, do not languish. You have such a face, as if there was the end of the world people. Casey took a sip of the flavored drink and said, Honestly, Lucy, I don't even know if it's the end of the world or the beginning myself. Lucy raised her eyebrows. I understand that your tenants have done something wrong again. Casey waved her hand. If they had, I could have dealt with them myself. No, Lucy, this is different. And frankly, I'm at a loss. Remember when I told you my brother was missing? Lucy opened her mouth. Of course, it's not something you forget. But if I'm not mistaken, it's been 30 years. Why do you remember that? Casey corrected automatically. It's been 40, you know, it's weird. The day I locked the boy out of the skateboard, he put a toy in my hands said his grandfather had given it to him and that it would bring me luck or something like that. I put it in my bag and forgot about it. And then when I got home, I remembered about it. You see, Lucy, it may sound absurd, but it was with Harvey when he disappeared. Lucy even stood up, but she sat down immediately. No, Casey, you're definitely wrong. I mean, come on, it's been years and there's been tons of toys like this. And besides, you said that his mom was dressed very well, all dressed up, all dressed up so they're not poor, and you really think a kid would play with a toy that's 40 years old? No way. I get it, Lucy. I mean, look at this toy. It's definitely 40 years old. Plus, I couldn't be wrong because Grandpa Buddy made it for me. Casey pulled out the toy and held it out to her friend Lucy fidgeted with it for a long time, then set it on the table. She frowned, then looked at her friend with a Sherlock Holmes look. So what do we have? 
We have a piece of evidence that disappeared along with the child 40 years ago. Harvey must be 48 years old now. Look, but if you're so sure, we should track down this boy and ask his parents about his grandfather. I don't know how to find him now, though. I found him, or rather his family, and I think I found his grandfather. It was by accident. I saw a picture of them together. Casey, what kind of person are you? Come on. Tell me where you saw it. Lucy even jumped up and walked around the kitchen. In general, she wanted to smash her friend more painfully so that she wouldn't pull like a cat by the tail. Lucy, that picture is in the study. You're telling me. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. It looks like Harry is this boy's grandfather. Lucy furrowed her brow. So wait, what's the boss's name? Harry. Well, see, he's not Harvey. I still don't know how he got that toy. What do I do, Lucy? You've always given me good advice, and now I just don't know what to do if I go to the warden with my questions. I'm afraid I won't get any answers and I'll be out of a job. Lucy drummed her fingers on the table. I'm in. Tell you what, friend, I suggest you wait a little while and gather information. Anything you can find out about his family, we can use. Casey stared at her friend in horror. How am I supposed to do that? Lucy shrugged her shoulder patiently. I don't know, be more attentive to the conversations and look more closely. I'll have to look on the internet. Oh my God, how am I supposed to do that? Lucy waved me off again. I'll take care of that. When she saw her friend's confused look, she laughed. Don't be frightened. I'm also with the internet as an overseas guest. The thing is that next to us is a small square. There is often a gathering of young people, all so advanced, games on the internet discuss. So, of course, they never have any money, but they want to go to the toilet. Apparently, they are not completely lost because they don't shit in the park. They come to bank me. I put them down, but only when the bosses are gone. I'm going to have them look him up on the internet. As Casey left, Lucy lowered her voice conspiratorially and said, Meet me exactly one week from today at the same place. Casey took a swing at her friend. Oh, come on, Lucy. You can't be serious. If you knew how hard this is for me right now. Lucy got serious right away. Don't take offense, Casey. I can see that. I'm just trying to cheer you up a little bit. As soon as Casey entered the apartment, both her son-in-law and daughter came out to meet her. They crossed their arms over their chests and stared at her in silence. Casey realized that some unpleasant conversation was about to take place again, and even had time to think that if it hadn't been for Joe, she would probably have asked them to move out by now. Waiting for her tennis to get started, she didn't. Started on her own. Well, what happened this time while I was away? I hope you didn't forget to pick up your child from daycare. Lily glanced indignantly at her son-in-law and spoke. It's us, Mom, who would like to know what's going on with you. You've stopped being at home at all. You finish work and then you disappear somewhere. And by the way, we had movie tickets for tonight. Casey shrugged. But no one said anything to me about a movie. Mom, you're an old person. It's only natural that you should go home after work. Why should I warn you? Lily's voice was getting higher, and her son-in-law nodded in agreement to her words. Casey looked at him then stopped her gaze on her daughter. First of all, I don't owe anyone anything. Second, well, what if I'm elderly? I can't have any business. And third, I'm very tired. If you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I'm going to lie down. She shrugged off her daughter and son-in-law, who were speechless, and went to her room. She closed the door firmly behind her and sat down on the bed. She took out a conic and sat for a long time, clasping it in the palm of her hand. Her memory brought back scenes from the past and large tears rolled down her cheeks. She thought she couldn't take it for a week, but Harry was away on some business trip, so even if Casey had dared to talk to him, she wouldn't have caught him. The staff, on the other hand, had been very good to Casey. They had become more relaxed. The first person Casey started to hear from was Leslie. They ran into each other in the hallway just a day after Harry left. Casey, it's so good to see you. It's so nice to see you. I've forgotten the last time I saw you. Casey was a little embarrassed. I try not to show my face too much. You know, away from the bosses, Leslie laughed. I'm not the boss. You don't have to hide from me. And you know what, Casey? I see that you have already finished. But come to my office. We'll have tea. Sit and talk. You'll tell me how your relatives are doing. 
Casey wanted to refuse at once, but immediately stopped herself. Leslie had known Harry for a long time. She might have something interesting to say. Thank you. I'd love to accept your invitation. I'll just put everything down and change my clothes. Oh, that's fine. Then I'll be waiting for you. During the conversation, Casey learned that Harry had come here as a family not long ago from some distant city and that Harry's son was already married here and that he had a daughter-in-law. Casey, of course, was glad of that information as well. She'd already guessed it herself. But what to judge her? All young people are like that nowadays. Take her daughter, for instance. That's all she learned all week. Casey began to pack up for the weekend in the morning. Lily gave her a startled look. Mom, where are you going? It's the weekend. We thought you'd be home. That's right. It's my day off so I'm resting. But Casey looked questioningly at her daughter, and she turned and shouted, Hugh, come here. Casey looked with interest at her son-in-law, who came out of the room with a traveling bag in his hands. He asked irritably, What you know I'm packing? Lily replied, Ah, looks like you might not be packing. Our mom was going out again. My son-in-law even dropped his bag. What do you mean we have to leave in an hour? Casey realized that once again her kids hadn't bothered to tell her they were going somewhere. Apparently she hadn't made it clear to them that she was no longer their servant. I don't understand now, you've lost your keys to the apartment or something, you're going somewhere, so I'm not keeping them. Hugh coughed. The thing is, we were going to be friends outdoors. Casey nodded. Good thing you go sure, but buy something from mosquitoes. Joe can't stand them. Hugh and Lily looked at each other confused. But we hadn't planned to take Joe. It's adults only. I wonder what about you? You've got a baby. Casey understood perfectly and even thought of something to keep Joe busy while she and Lucy talked and drank tea. But she didn't want to give up so easily. But we thought you'd be with Joe. You haven't been paying much attention to your grandson lately. Well, that's a bit of a stretch. I think a child should spend more time with his parents and trips like this should be arranged in advance. Casey was beginning to boil and Lily immediately caught this change in her mother's mood. In general, her mother had become very nervous lately and could scold them for anything. Mommy, please forgive us for not warning you, but if we refuse, we will let everyone down. Lily looked at her with such pleading eyes that Casey waved her hand. What am I going to do with you, Joe? Pack up, we're going to Lucy's. Come on. Joe jumped out of the room with joyful squeals. He loved Lucy because she was cheerful and let him do everything. Lucy opened the door with a very puzzled look. Oh, what guests? Casey, I made a cherry pie, just like I knew I would. Joe immediately disappeared into the kitchen and Casey threw off her coat. What happened to your face, Lucy? I'll tell you what the boys dug up, and you'll have one just like it. Casey stared at her friend. I take it your little geniuses found something interesting. Come on, let's get your tea cold and I'll tell you all about it. Well, let's start with the fact that Harry is in person, local, he moved in a while ago. Casey interrupted her. I know that already I could have done without the mysterious face. Lucy gave her a puzzled look. You know, not all of Harry's parents lived here before. That they just up and left for a faraway city. Now, attention to the question. When did they do it? Casey didn't understand. When did they? A month after your brother went missing. Yeah, the effect was even better than Lucy could have expected. Casey turned so pale that Lucy grabbed a valerian. Do you want me to give you a shot? No, you don't want to take your grandson out for a walk, it'll stink. But I still don't get it. You think they took Harvey away. But why? Besides, he's Harry, not Harvey. But Casey, don't be so childish. Your boss's parents were very well-to-do, so you don't think they'd take the boy away and leave him their name. Yeah, you're probably right. Why? Lucy shrugged. I don't know that. But the boys told me that Harry was their only son. And doing the math, it turns out his mom gave birth to him when she was 44. You know what I mean. Casey shook her head again. No, I don't. They probably didn't have kids and it was too late to have kids. Casey had it all figured out in her head, which makes for a very interesting story. By the way, his son opens some business in another city, his father helps him, but the daughter-in-law threatens to file for divorce, because this city, you see, she does not suit her. 
K. Eze sat in silence. To be honest, now she was even more confused about what she should do. She wouldn't go to her master to find out if he was her brother or not. Casey, did you fall asleep? Casey woke up. No, I'm sorry, I was just thinking. Casey, what do you think you're gonna do? I don't know Lucy. I mean, he might not even want to listen to me. I'll lose my job and I won't find out anything. That's true too, but you can't just go on living like that. Casey nodded. So we'll go find out and we'll figure something out about the job. Don't forget, I've had people come to see me like you wouldn't believe. After an hour, Joe got bored and Casey started packing. Lucy was standing in the hallway, giving her advice. You go straight ahead, not at first. First show him the toy, then tell him how you saved his grandson, and only then everything else, so that he doesn't send you away at once. That way he'll listen. Casey, who had already taken the coat, suddenly lowered Lucy's hand. And if it's not him, but could Harvey lost the toy to give or something else? He could, of course, but if you don't talk, you won't know. Casey realized that everything was right in Lucy's words, but now she could only think that if Harry was not Harvey, you would be very hurt, almost as it was when her little brother disappeared. Grandma, well, Grandma. Casey woke up, looked at her grandson who was dragging her by the hand. What, Joe, let's go. Let's go quickly. There's already a competition. Casey sighed. Well, of course they would be watching those young boys again, risking themselves for no clear reason on those planks with wheels. They had been standing at the fence for about half an hour when someone nearby said, Grandpa, look, there she is. Kaitis had turned indifferently to the voice, not thinking that these words were about her, and immediately froze. In front of them stood that very boy, and behind him, her boss Harry towered behind him. Hello. He too looked at the company janitor confused. Hello, Casey. My grandson told me about being rescued by a woman, but I had no idea that the woman would be you. She smiled weakly. Nonsense. I didn't realize how it happened. I'm sorry, I should probably thank you in some way. That you don't need to. It's completely unnecessary. I should give you something. The boys were already playing catch-up. Casey and Harry went over to a vacant bench and sat down. Well, those are some horses. Harry accepted the toy as if it were a jewel. Thank you very much. That toy means a lot to me. And then Casey made up her mind. I know, because it's been with you since your past life, since you were a child. He looked at her in surprise. Your grandson told you that. She shook her head. Harry, if you have time, I would like to tell you a story that happened in my family 40 plus years ago. She definitely saw the man turn pale and immediately started talking. When she finished the story, the knuckles of the fingers with which Harry was clutching the toy turned white. Without raising his eyes, he spoke. I had a very good family, and not even in the sense that I always had everything, but in the sense that I was very loved, and I was loved. My parents would do anything for me. The only thing that bothered me a little bit was that I had no memory of early childhood at all. But by the time I was 14, I had calmed down because I had other things on my mind. But then when I was in my early 30s, my wife died. I was in such shock, in such a space, that I shut myself off. I didn't care about my son. I didn't care about my mom. And by that time, she was all I had left. Questions began to arise in my head, though I was not looking for answers because I wrote off everything to the peculiarities of a child's organism. I even read somewhere that if a child has experienced some kind of stress, the brain can simply block that time. It took me a few years to come to my senses, but as soon as I came to my senses, my mom got sick. I tried to be around her as much as possible, knowing full well that she would be leaving us very soon. We talked a lot, and one day I asked a question. Mom, nothing happened to me as a child, because for some reason I don't remember anything at all. And my mom suddenly cried, saying that she couldn't take this secret to the grave. She began to tell me how she and my father wanted children, but nothing worked. Back then, of course, medicine was not as advanced as it is now, so they had to come to terms with time. They had already thought about taking a child in an orphanage, but I don't know, for some reason they were procrastinating. That day, they made up their minds. True, they decided to go only to another town, not far from where they lived. It was a miracle that dad managed to slow down because only at the last moment he saw a child sitting on the road. It was me. 
Mom said that they also glimpsed a woman running across the field. They didn't catch up with her because she didn't look normal. My mom grabbed me in her arms and started to calm me down. There was no village nearby, and they didn't understand where I had come from. But at that very moment, my mom decided that I would be better off with them than with the kind of parents who allowed this to happen. I didn't believe it. I begged my mother to tell me it wasn't true, because my whole world collapsed in an instant. But she went on and on, spilling the details. The only reason I came to this town was because they were from here. Casey touched his arm gently. So you're my brother Harvey. He looked at her strangely, then stood up. I'm sorry, I don't know. It's all kind of weird, it's kind of scary. Of course, I came here hoping to learn something else. But now I think I've learned too much that I can't get my head around. Casey, I have to ask why my mother did this to me. Casey's up. Mother? No, you're thinking all wrong. Your mother went to the bathroom for a minute, asked an elderly woman to watch you. They found her, then found out she wasn't herself. They let her out of the hospital every now and then and she rode the trains aimlessly. She didn't remember taking her child out of the carriage, although someone recognized her and certainly didn't remember where she had taken him. Mom was sick at once. Not a day went by that she didn't go crazy. By the way, there's only four of us in the family. You have a brother and a sister too. Harry clutched his head. Bullshit. This is crazy. It doesn't work like that. There's no such thing as a movie plot in real life. Casey had expected a slightly different reaction, to be honest. Now she was watching the man who, grabbing her grandson's hand, was walking quickly down the path. She smiled. Well, that's all right. He is also understandable. He is an oligarch. She is a cleaner. The main thing is that now she knows for sure Harvey is alive and all is well with him. Casey called out to Joe and they headed for home without missing the ice cream stand, of course. Monday morning, she called Leslie and told her she was sick. She also told them to look for a new cleaning lady because she was quitting. But Casey, it was still good. Maybe you're not happy with the paycheck. I'll talk to Harry and I think he'll go along with it. No, you don't have to. It's just a family emergency. Excuse me, Leslie, I'm sorry. Several times the daughter came into the room, once even the son-in-law. Finally, Lily couldn't take it anymore. They all came into her room together. Mom, what's going on? Are you sick? Casey sat on the bed. What are you worried about? That I'm not going to work. The son-in-law stepped forward. You're wrong, Casey. I just got my paycheck, even more than I expected, and Lily will get her soon. So if you're sick, we wanted to tell you not to worry about anything. Casey looked at her son-in-law, at her daughter in surprise. Her eyes watered, but she didn't have time to answer because the doorbell rang. Hugh went to open it, and Lily crouched on her bed. Really, you're not ill, are you? No, I'm fine, really. Casey didn't tell her daughter anything. She was ashamed not for herself, but for Harry. She found her brother, and he ran away from her at once. Apparently afraid that she or they would ask for money, the brother-in-law came back into the room. His eyes were like saucers. Casey, there's Harry himself asking for you. Casey stood up quick, tears flowing down her cheeks quickly. Lily looked at her fearfully, and Harry was already entering the room. He was holding a huge bouquet of roses in his hands. He stopped two feet away from her and said, Well, hello, sis. I'm sorry it took me a while to digest all of this. He put his arm around Casey, and they stood like that for a long time. Casey was crying and Harry's eyes were closed. Lily looked from Harry to her mother, then to her husband, then asked, I don't understand, sis. Casey wiped away her tears, smiling. Well, this is Lily, your great uncle. Harvey is Lily, my daughter. This is Hugh, my son-in-law. Well, and Joe, you already know. Harry hugged Lily, then Hugh leaving him completely stunned. But I'll introduce you to my son too. They'll be here soon. Granson had thrown his skateboard away after all, had already fallen off it. Dad's taking him to the hospital to get his knees scanned and bandaged. He turned to Casey again. You know, Casey, I think I remember you now. I can't say for sure, but I think I do. The evening passed noisily. Harry was very easy to get along with. His son was immediately interested in Hugh's work. And then, when it came to computers, they went into another room altogether. The fact was that Hugh's cousin had started his own business in that very direction. 
Lily already knew that the brother was single again, that his wife, as soon as she found out that she had to go to the hole or stay at her father-in-law's house, had immediately made a pen, leaving her son to his father. So Lily was going hard over in her head all of her unmarried friends, because a good man should be married and no one. Harry and Casey were looking at old and new pictures. And Barry Nanny, where are they that we can meet them? We don't talk much. They started dividing up the inheritance on the day of the funeral, and then they split up. Casey, promise me we'll visit them too, at least once, and we'll see how it goes. Okay. As Harry, his son and grandson got ready to leave, Casey said quietly, Harry should probably go to the cemetery to visit his parents. Yes, Casey, I will. I'm sorry, what happened to your husband? I saw a picture of him standing in front of our firm. But it wasn't your firm then. The brass was cutting corners. There was an accident. Four people died, and it was blamed on them. Harry frowned. You mean no one got paid anything? That's exactly what I'm saying. He looked up at her. You know, even though I wasn't there then, I'm still in favor of justice. You might be able to find the family members of those who died. Sure. Let them know I'm expecting them on Friday. Two days later, they were standing by the graves. Mom was strict. She was busy. You know, there were four of us, and Dad made a pen. She just didn't have time for sentimentality. But she loved us very much, because when you were lost, she never got back to normal and ended up going crazy. Harry knelt down in front of his mother's grave. Mom, I don't remember you at all, but I'm sure I loved you very much, just as you loved me. I'm a little late, but I promise I'll come to you often and tell you how I live without you. Casey brushed away her tears and smiled. I'm sure she sees everything and is very happy for us.